The following program is a collection of stooges talking about happenings in the sports world. It is meant to be comedic informative. The opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect the beliefs of their peers, their boss, or ESPN. There may be some cuss words because that's how humans in the real world talk. If you are young, please seek permission before watching any further. Hey! Why? Let's go! This show stinks, and the fact that you listen, we are very, very thankful for. Ah! The all-time leading tackler for the Green Bay Packers, you pink! Be a friend, tell a friend something nice could change their life. We want that! We want that! Sport, 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 sport! Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to our humble abode, the Thunderdome, on this Feel Good Friday, February 2nd, 2024. This sports program starts right now! Football! It's glorious, and this week we have uh, attempted to do something that I'm not sure has ever happened before, certainly not for our program. Now, we had the incredible opportunity to chit-chat with Tom Brady on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Greatest of all time in everybody's ass. Oh, yeah. Then on Wednesday when we were talking to Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes actually dropped his head into the mm -hmm. side of that thing. Yep. It's like, wait a second now. Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes are. And then Peyton Manning was on the show just yesterday because... He's talking about the Pro Bowl games in which started last night. He's coaching one of them. So you got Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, what? Peyton Manning. What? And it's like, hold on. Now there's about five to six people that are on basically everybody's Mount Rushmore list. But there's one particular guy that we've never had on our program. Mm, no. And if we were to have him on this particular program, especially because he played for both teams that have, are playing in a Super Bowl next weekend, this would be like an NFL quarterback Mount Rushmore week that just kind of uh, we stumbled into. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, breaking news, Joe Montana is joining us Hell yeah. in Come about 19 yes! minutes. So we got Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, Peyton Manning to Joe Montana. Wow. Let's have an incredible week before the Super Bowl week. We can't wait to chat with him. It's our first time ever having him on the program. He is a Pittsburgh guy, a Western Pennsylvania guy, who obviously went on to do phenomenal things in the football world. Everybody loves him. Everybody calls him the coolest guy of all time. I got a chance to meet him one time on vacation, shook his hand, and just radiated through me. Oh, yeah. Of course. This is a cool son of a bitch I ever talked to. Look at his pies on from Pittsburgh. Can't wait to talk to him in about 18 minutes or so. And I'm proud of our program being able to pull this yeah, off. Seriously. There's a lot of things being said about us, boys. Mm -hmm. A lot of things being said about us. Always. Whenever it comes to daily show, though, daily sports, I'm not 100% sure this has been pulled off in some time. And what an honor it is to mm -hmm. get a chance to chat to all these phenomenal people who have done so much for the sport that we love. Now, also in a sport that we absolutely love, Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, he wow. had his introductory uh, press conference yesterday. Uh, for the LA Chargers, right. mm -hmm. said so many great things. Yeah, gems, tons. Made a Shawshank Redemption metaphor mm -hmm. about how he feels about the journey ahead. He chit chatted about Justin Herbert and even did like a reenactment of what he did when he looked at him. Whoa. <laughs> Look at this guy. He brought up the fact that one of the first things he did whenever he got into the building, I, I think we even got it legitimized from a source within the building. Night before, signs contract, wakes up next morning, goes to Home Depot, gets a shop vac, he's cleaning up the weight room. Perfect. And then the way he compared that to is, you guys are hungry? Good. This weight room is all you can eat buffet, boys. Yeah, it This is. is what he is. And he Don't talked about eat. how he has heard about the work ethic of the team. And L.A. is a place where guys spend their off seasons. Yep. So he's basically trying to build that culture immediately right now before he even draft or combine or OTA start. He's like, let's dive into this entire thing. Feels like they got the right one over there. Can't wait to chat with him in a second hour. We'll talk to Jim Harbaugh. Let's go. Yeah, then we have Michael Lombardi on. A lot of things coming out about Bill Belichick sure. and his entire coaching cycle. Michael Lombardi will tell us about what he knows or what he thinks about the entire process. Obviously, whenever Bill Belichick got an award at the White House, he was allowed to invite 10 people with him. Michael Lombardi was one of the mm -hmm. 10 people. That's so, right. let's assume he might know what he's talking about. Former GM, multiple-time Super Bowl champion. Started with Al Davis, who Harbaugh also started with. I think Lombardi was there whenever Harbaugh got his first ever job. Then we'll have a weekly wrap-up with uh, Rap Sheet and Friends, us being the friends, he being Rap Sheet, Ian Rappaport in the third hour. Ooh. And then our friend Adam Pacman Jones is releasing his first uh, song through the Universal Record label today. Yo. So we'll wrap up this Feel Good Friday with Pacman stopping by to talk about Ferrari Kit. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Bang. It's his new song he released through Universal Music, which we are incredibly pumped for him. He's been working his ass off this fall. Two podcasts, trying to build a rap career, everything yeah. like that. Uh, obviously, 
Adam Pacman Jones went to West Virginia. I've known him since I'm like 17 years old. He's been through a lot, but I think he's at a good spot mm -hmm. in his life at this particular stage. Has certainly put himself through things. Now we're going into a weekend with him having his first label release single. There so, yeah. pump it in. It should be a great day. Hell yeah. And we're just, what? Eight, nine days away from the Super Bowl? Yeah. We're just a few days away from traveling to Las Vegas to do Radio yep. Row? What? We're just a few days away from getting a chance to experience and feel all the things that are great about the Super Bowl, especially in Las Vegas. The people that are reaching out to us saying, hey, we'll be in town. You want to, hey, we'll be in town. You want to, hey, we'll be in town. We're like, we're not really booking anything because we like to keep the schedule kind of free, especially Super Bowl week. But I think the guests we're going to have on next week Phenomenal as well. Oh, so we are so incredibly lucky to be doing this. We're thankful to be doing this, and I'm not doing it alone, obviously. The talks table is here. At Boston Connor and at Ty Schmidt. Ty, you look fantastic. Happy Feel Good Friday to you. Hey, thank you. Happy Feel Good Friday to you as well. I mean, what a week. What a week. What a week. And then next week. What another week. What a week. I mean, it's just a great time to be alive. And then the person next to you, he came in this morning with this shirt on, really feeling himself. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were listening to something mm -hmm. that I think Jim Harbaugh was saying, trying to get the exact phrasing so that whenever we talk to him, we don't look like dipshits. You know, a little bit of studying, a little sure, bit of yeah. research before we get in there. And Connor's just standing in the <laughs> front of the room like this, pretty much. 35, 40 seconds. Nobody says anything <laughs> to him because we're all listening. And he goes, so, so, so. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? And we're like, sorry, Connor, we're trying to listen to this. Are you listening to it? Do you, do you, do you? <laughs> You're really proud of this shirt. Yeah, I was really proud. I mean, look at this thing. This thing is, this is a Super Bowl shirt, first of all. I was going to say this for the Super Bowl, but I said to myself, you know, this is the last 2023 NFL season Feel Good Friday in the Thunderdome. I might as well go ahead and go, oh, oh, oh stay too dead. Stay. Well, now he's directing the top, traffic. Well, the top, I, I wanted you to make sure you see the top walls oh, well, We as well. see them. It's not just the. It's not just this big one over here. I'm worried it's because you've you've said this a couple times that you've worn your Super Bowl shirts early. You're gonna yeah, have shirts are shirt. gonna suck next week. Well, yeah. no, no, that's the thing, gentlemen. Oh, boys, please, the shirts are not gonna suck <laughs> next week. Let me just say that I've been holding on to two that I've still had from this summer. Okay, there have been other shipments since. The summer Super Bowl shirts wore. So these have kind of got bumped out of the Super exactly. Bowl. Exactly. It's been like, well, not bumped out. Yeah, I don't want to know. Not bumped out. No, no, no. Not bumped out. That shirt got bumped out. And they, now we know exactly how you feel about that shirt. So whenever you walk into a room early see? with that shirt on, good. All right, see? anybody? Anybody? You guys. Anybody? That's literally what you did. Two oh, yeah. minutes. Oh, yeah. You guys. You two guys minutes of peacocking nice. in the room. They better be and good next week. They better that shirt be good. got bumped out. Yeah. It didn't get bumped. The fact that you guys think that I would just wear this shirt all willy nilly, bump it out on a, a feel good Friday. I wore this shirt specifically knowing that what? The Mount Rushmore week was coming to an end. So do I want to wear a regular shirt or do I want to wear a Mount Rushmore shirt, gentlemen? Okay. okay. Why don't you answer me that? One. Two. I'm not going to sit here like some jackass when Joe Montana <laughs> is coming on the show, okay? I'm not going to wear just a normal uh, normal shirt. Right, man. Right. I'm not going to wear a polar bear or a sloth I'd or, like to apologize. or an elephant, okay? I need to wear It's something. a Joe Montana shirt. Yeah, this, got this it. is a okay. Montana shirt. Thank you. For there those that don't know, for years we've been hoping for the day that Joe Montana will come on. Oh, yeah. The legend. Numerous members of this particular program are from the Pittsburgh area, western Pennsylvania, Numerous people on this particular program or show are Italians from yep. Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area. So whenever you're talking about great Italian Americans out of Western Pennsylvania, I mean, Joseph Montana yeah. is very near the top. Ringgold High. Absolute legend. And uh, we've told the story numerous times. Exactly. And we don't know if it's true. It is. Right? It is. In our mind, it is true. And we apologize to the journalists who are deeply offended by our appearances on ESPN every single day. Mm -hmm. But the way we remember the story going mm -hmm. from our calculation of the news right. in this brain, and I think everybody else's, Joe Montana was babysitting his granddaughter. Mm -hmm. That's right. Somebody broke into the house while he was upstairs sleeping. Bingo. Mm -hmm. They want to steal grandbaby. Mm -hmm. He wakes up from his slumber upstairs. Mm -hmm. He's up on top of the steps. They're down at the bottom, almost exiting. He grabs the ball from one of the four Super Bowls that are in a plaque, mm -hmm. yep. pulls it out, throws football downstairs, hits kidnapper in dome. Mm -hmm. Boom. Bust nose, yep. concussion, CTE city down. Slides down banister, Joe yep. Cool Montana. Mm -hmm. yep. Catches grandbaby, Bingo. puts foot on kidnapper, Calls 911. Bingo. Boom. That's how the story goes. Exactly. 100% exactly. It on it. Not 100% sure if the exact descriptors Scur of how we told the story happened, did. but he did actually save a kidnapping from happening oh, yeah. for a grandbaby of his. He's just considered the coolest guy of all time. He doesn't do a lot of media, I don't think. No. So, like, the fact that we get to chat with him 
just this, like a week out from the Super Bowl, in which it could be called the Joe Montana Bowl. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he oh, played yeah. for the Niners, obviously had massive success. He played for the Chiefs, went to an AFC championship in just a few short years of playing over there. And now we get to talk to him. Tone Diggs, one half of the hammer. Damn, Cowboys, this is the dumbest life of all time, pal. It's incredibly stupid uh, to have. You know, even even having Eli on uh, this week, who beat one of the goats twice and has two Super Bowls, to have Joe on to to have. Oh yeah, I did see some Giants fans when we put out the graphic of the Mount Rushmore, just being like, so so Eli just on the show, nothing, don't even put him as a foothill on the entire thing. I'm like, we love Eli. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. we love Eli. Took the lead. Great foothill. Yeah, I was I was upset. Seven wasn't on there, but you know, not everyone can have. There's five to six people. I, I said that. Yeah, thing. exactly. There's Aaron Rodgers, obviously, right. on a Mount Rushmore in pretty much everybody's eyes. Mm-hmm. Brett there's, Favre. There's only four slots on there, yeah, which is, you know, pardon my take, does the Mount Rushmore season. And four is obviously a good number to do top four. But when you're talking about NFL quarterbacks, different generations, different teams, dynasties, rules, number of games, like, it's hard to just pick four. So there's like five to six people that are on everybody's Mount Rushmore. We certainly completed one of them, though, this week. Oh, yeah. You know, if we would have done a Pantheon, then we could. it would have been a lot easier to fit all the greats on there, but Shit. this is Mount Rushmore. I mean, we only have five days in a, Bingo. In exactly. a week. Tony, exactly. I mean, the Pantheon idea is great, though. I didn't even think of that. We'll, we'll do it next year. Well, that's because you're Irish. Well, who's going to be booking that? Are you booking the Pantheon? I, I can start now. I mean, the Mount Rushmore booking was not simple this week, but <laughs> we are incredibly lucky and pumped for this. The Harbaugh conversation in the second hour should be hilarious. The Joe Montana conversation should be cool mm-hmm. like yeah. we are in for a great feel good friday let's start talking about some things that have also happened around the sports world mm. now whenever you think about the nfl uh you think about you know the san francisco 49ers being a team that has been loaded for the last uh, what handful of years yeah. five six yeah. years expected to win a super bowl every single time numerous different quarterbacks have played quarterback mm-hmm. for the san francisco 49ers team they tried to figure out who's the right trigger man to get them over the hump to go jed york owner of the san francisco 49ers 49ers actually chit chat about Kyle Shanahan's thoughts about Brock Purdy week one in the training camp. And first of all, had no idea this is what this human looked like. Mm-mm. Had no idea mm. this is what he sounded like. And this story completely debunks seemingly what Peter King was trying to put off into the media just yesterday. I said his his honesty, his directness. You know, I mean, we haven't really really talked much about Brock, but I mean that's a that's a good example of Kyle's directness. You know, last year in in preseason, I think week one of training camp, which you have a a quarterback that we're paying, I think, $20 million to. You have a guy that you drafted with investing three first round picks into. And he grabs me after practice. He's like, hey, hey man, we got to talk. And that's generally not a good thing when your coach (laughs) tells you you got to talk. Like, all right, what's up? And he's like, "Uh, I think our third string quarterback's our best quarterback. Like, okay. I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, well, he's like, obviously, like, we've invested in Trey. Like, Trey's doing a good job. Like, we're going to do everything that we can. We're not going to change that. We're, and we're not going to change the chart, sure. the depth chart. But, like, I, I, I think Brock will end up being our quarterback at some point. And, like, he didn't force it. Right? You had two injuries, and that's how Brock ended up playing. But he's, he's always honest. Even if it's not, like, one thing that owners don't love to hear when they've invested money – and or draft picks or both into people that the last pick in the draft is the guy that we think is the best. That's that's, that's generally not great news, um, but but he's honest and he let it play out the right way. You know, Brock. I think ironically, I think his first game was against the Chiefs, and he, he had some mop up time, and I, Brock. I think he threw one ball into the stands, and you know. I may or may not have had some sarcastic <laughs> comments for, for Kyle post game, um, but when Brock took over last year, like I think we had a calm about us. But there was a sense that like nothing catches you by surprise. And, and again, like you you might not love everything that Kyle tells you, but he's always open and honest, especially in the moment. And he's very clear about that with me. It's like, look, I will tell you exactly what I think of a player, a situation, a coach in the moment. But that might not be how I feel three weeks from now. So don't hold me to this is what I said about somebody in training camp when we're in week six of the season. Like, ask me in the moment what, what you want to ask about whoever, and I'll, I'll give you my open and honest opinion. And again, you might not always love what he says, but 
I've, I've been around enough people in this league to know that you don't always get a straight comment from from people in those positions, and, and Kyle will always shoot you and straight. For, for that point, point. People lying, says mm-hmm. Jed York, owner of the Niners. Did any of us know that's what that guy looked like? No. no. I had no clue. Allegedly, he's from Youngstown, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Shout out to all the Paisanos in Youngstown, obviously the Penguins and everything like that. I did not know that was the owner. Well, how did this dude end up the owner? Very cool. Like, Oh, yeah. The way he talked there, loved it. Mm-hmm. The story he told, the way he delivered the story, the way he also, had, you know, was like, yeah, not great whenever you hear, hey, you're paying like $100 million to this particular guy. I don't think he's the one. Yeah. Uh, you traded three basic first rounders for yep. this guy. Uh, I don't think he's the one. Well, so what are you geniuses in charge for? He's a, a potential owner mm-hmm. thought. Uh, the third string is the guy. And I like the fact just rolled with it. He's like, all right, well, hey, if that's the case, let's go ahead and do this. Having complete faith in the people that you put into positions of power and then them showing up for you. First of all, it has to feel good for Shanahan, who was on the record last week saying, I'll see you on stage, man, mm-hmm. to John Lynch, Sweet. and then it happening. And then him telling Jed York, the owner, first week of training camp, like, our third string guy is the guy in this whole thing. Shanahan's got a big brain, but also shout out to Jed York being seemingly a very reachable, active owner and handling it all perfectly. And who the hell is it? Did we know that was the, he owns the team? That's- so he is the acting CEO right now. I believe his mom owns 90% of the team. His uncle, Eddie DeBartolo, who is his mom's brother, used to be the owner. And then I don't know if it was like some – legal issues or something, but she came in and she got 90% ownership of the team, which she still has, and he's the acting CEO. I assume, you know, you assume that he's going to be kind of the next one, but there was a, I was reading, there was a story going around that like when he first became the CEO, Niners started 0-5, and and I think he's told someone in the media like, we're going to rip off 10 straight wins or something like that and go to the playoffs and everyone kind of shit on him like, hey, this nepotism kid, like the only reason he's in this business is because of his uncle and because of his mom, like doesn't really get it, doesn't understand. They didn't make the playoffs, but I think they they won like nine of their last 10 games or something like that and he started to get a little bit more respect around the building and everything. And yeah, I'd never heard him talk before, I don't think so. Definitely didn't know that's what he looked like, but that that's a really cool clip and it seems like, you know, he... He obviously knows what he's doing. Like they trust Shanahan completely, and it doesn't seem like he's one of these owners or people in charge who wants it to be known. Like, hey, this is my team. You know, like he's letting Shanahan do his thing and kind of just trusting him and believing in his vision. And I would like to let everybody know: certainly a product of nepotism. Well, Absolutely, sure. everything Absolutely. they said about him. Certainly, that's not his fault, though. No, no. no. You know, it's not, at least you know there's we've seen it before where products of nepotism feel as if they've earned the right and they have an obliviousness to them and a lack of self-awareness and a lack of talent normally and drive and uh, everything that you would expect or hope for people in positions that they get handed to. But like him, he understands, I assume, that he, yeah, I mean, my mom's Mm -hmm. brother, I end up being a CEO of a team. There's only 32 of these. This is a dream for everybody. To remain a human, seemingly, yeah. is phenomenal. And then for the success that they're having with the way it's being operated, good for him, good for them. Good for mom, good for son, good for family, good for team. Yeah, good for all of them. But the uh, I, I enjoyed the nice little look behind the scenes where Kyle's like, you know what? Listen, we got 20 in Jimmy. Uh, we got three first-rounders um, in the in a first-round draft pick. Um, the third guy's... He's the best. I'm not gonna change. I'm not gonna. We're not gonna ruffle any feathers. I'm not gonna change the depth chart. Okay. I just, I just gotta let you know. Okay. Like I assume there's, I assume that happens a lot in the NFL where there's someone uh, further down the uh, draft board who is better, who they don't immediately get the shot because of what has been invested in players in front of them. So that kind of goes back to the conversation about Brock Purdy about how, like I said last week, whenever I was going into second year, this dude was handed nothing. Like, this Mm -hmm. dude, as the last pick of the draft, you are promised nothing. Now, whereas his family successful, I'm not talking about life. I'm talking about in football. I'm talking you have two or three bad training camp practices. You aren't able to hit either the scout team or maybe what they want you to throw on the defensive side. They'll find some other arm for you because you're a seventh rounder. There's not a lot of money invested in you. So he's literally had to earn every single step of the way. And to your point, yeah, there's a lot of other positions where it takes place as well. You just hope... Yeah, that the football gods, because it is a um, a meritocracy, mm-hmm. professional athletics. Yep. I feel like it is a meritocracy. Mm-hmm. It's one of the final ones on earth, that, almost, yeah. where you actually have to earn your spot or you'll get exposed. 
there's been a lot of stories about guys who've been drafted late. I mean, Tom Brady the other day was on. I mean, we're about to have a third rounder on uh, mm-hmm. joining us who ended up on the Mount Rushmore as well, where you outperform, and it feels like in professional athletics, there's no real ceiling that can hold you. If you have talent and you have a work ethic and you go about doing things the right way, you can find your way to the top. It's beautiful. Brock Purdy has done that. So is the man that's joining us right now. Italian-American out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay? Oh, what did he do in football? I don't know. How about four-time Super Bowl champ, three-time Super Bowl MVP, two-time MVP, eight-time Pro Bowler, five-time All-Pro, became a legend at Notre Dame. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe the coolest human of all time. And to finish out a Mount Rushmore of NFL quarterback week that we have had and so lucky to be a part of, ladies and gentlemen, a man who played for the Niners and the Kansas City Chiefs. Joe Montana. Yeah! Hey, how are you guys doing? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that stands in, in, when I was coming up the hill at the beach in Hawaii. In Illinois. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, as soon as I, I saw your ass down at the beach, you know, there, where, where we were, there's a beach, then there's like a long walkway, and then there's like a resort up here. And I and the wife, we have a nice little spot up on a perch where we uh, maybe take too many edibles and just kind of look out for hours at a time. That's kind of what I do. And I was standing up there, and I looked down at the beach, and I go, that's Joe Montana done. I, 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 Sam, that's uh, – and then you started walking up, and as you're getting closer, I'm like – Holy shit, that's Joe Montana. And I understand that you were probably trying to get away from people at that moment, but I just couldn't help myself. I'm like, boom! Joe, how you doing? Pat McAfee, very nice to meet you. You're the greatest of all time. Like, you were so cool. Everybody says that about you, man. Is that something that you, like, try to do? Do you think you were born with it? Because there's a story about you looking in the Super Bowl into the stands and be like, holy shit, John Kane. And it's like, like, have you just always been that guy? Why do you think that is kind of how you're labeled, you think, Joe? I don't know. I'm not sure. But I mean, it's just one of those things where it's fun being in those positions. I mean, it's, you don't you don't look forward to being behind and have to do that all the time. But usually when you're in that position, you're probably part of the reason you're there. So you got to <laughs> figure out a way to, to find a way back. But um, I think one of the things that I learned uh, probably from Bill Walsh more than anything was, is that the reason you're able to relax so much is that uh, my preparation, you know, it, it was preparation, preparation, preparation with him because, you know, we didn't have the earpieces and our game plan when we, it was funny uh, I'll get to tell you a story about Theismann, but we would get 125, 135 passes in every game plan, two and three formations each. You had to you had to memorize the formations and what order Bill wanted them in. Then you'd have 30 runs that do the same thing, and we were playing in. Um, so you had to you would only get signaled just the play. You didn't get the formations because you didn't have enough time to do it. So you had to memorize all that, and so it was, took a lot of preparation to be there and to get ready for the game on top of practice and watching film. And uh, we had to study that part of it too, but we were playing in, we were playing in the pro bowl. We lost to the Redskins in the championship game. And Bill was, was the coach of the, of the NFC team. And first day Bill puts in 35 passes and Theismann goes, Oh my God, man, this is awesome. He gave us all our passes in one day. I go, what are you talking about? He'll install until Saturday. And he goes, no, he won't. I go, yes, he will. And he did. I mean, it wasn't as bad as a normal play, um, a playbook for, for a normal game in the season. But he probably we probably had 60 passes. He goes, what are we going to do with all these passes? I go, that's a ready list, buddy. Just get ready for it. So, of course, you're a genius, too, Joe. I mean, of course, you're a genius in this entire thing. That makes a lot of sense. You seemingly... uh, Yes. Yeah, you are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you are, Joe. And uh, I didn't even know that was an added bonus to this because I just assumed always just super gamer. Always super gamer. Able to turn it on when the lights are at the brightest. But you're talking about your preparation and your hard work. When you look at this Niners quarterback now and this Brock Purdy guy, I assume you've gotten a chance to interact with him and meet him. And I assume he, just like everybody else who's in the NFL and has ever been around football, is like starstruck by you. But what do you see from this Brock Purdy guy about why he's had success at such a young age, especially for a 49ers team that obviously has a massive following and has been yearning for something like this, maybe since you were there, Joe? Yeah, I, I think the thing I see is something that I think I figured out early on in my career was that what the offense is about, 
right? It wasn't about me. It was about getting the ball to the people who knew what to do with it because all I, I I'm the mailman. I'm a, this doesn't belong to me. I want to get it to somebody that knows how to run, knows how to catch. And we had, especially late in my career, when you get guys like Jerry Rice, John Taylor, Brent Jones, Roger Craig, um, on down the line, all you got to do is get the ball to them. And and I think if you look at the weapons that Rock's working with, he's figured that offense out. He understands what his position is. He doesn't try to make a big play. He knows when that chance will come and when he needs to do it. But in most cases, it's okay to punt. I got a pretty good defense, too. And that's when we had the same thing, right? That defense is pretty good. So, yeah, they're going to have to earn their money, too, at the same time. And, yeah, we're going to punt. And hopefully we don't punt too many times. But, you know, the defense, you got to, hey, you're up. Let's go. And um, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've seen of him is, you know, real because he understands it, he's calm in there. He has a great presence. And, you know, he's not trying to knock you out with a football. You know, he delivers a great catchable ball. I and mean, you talk to these guys and, and they'll tell you, you know, the ball, you know, very rare does it come in there harder than it's supposed to. And so. Yeah, he puts in a keyhole too, mm-hmm. Joe. It seems like his accuracy yeah. is just phenomenal. He's able to put it and find the spots. You talk about being a mailman and you talk about all the weapons you had and all the weapons he has. And you're in every Mount Rushmore conversation that there is. So, like, that. Job well done being a hell of a mailman. Yeah. Yep. Hell, absolutely hell of a mailman. But one of the things they say against Brock is that the offense is the offense and he has so much talent around him. Like it feels like they try to find everything to kind of bury him. And now it might be turning and who knows what it'll be after the Super Bowl, however he performs. But how do you feel about the whole game manager, game changer type conversation? Because the answer you just gave is like, Uh, managing the game is a massive piece (laughs) of the entire thing, Joe. I don't know why that became, like, slanderous almost. Um, He hasn't had the chance to work with other receivers, and I think that's that's not a negative on him. It's just that people haven't seen him do that yet. I mean, obviously there was some reason that, um, that the 49ers liked him to be able to take him last in the draft, the things that they saw on tape, and I, I don't think it's it will matter who who's out there. He's right now he's fortunate because he's got some he's got some pretty good studs out there that can give him the ball and hey they can go the distance and nothing wrong with that. Everybody's had those in their lifetime. So that give you know I I don't even think about that twice. I just think that it's a plus for him. He's um, in his second year, Joe. In your second year, yep. what were you at, like? <laughs> I mean, obviously. I don't know how often you think about the early days of you in the NFL, but like year one, year two, year three, was there a time where you thought you had it figured out maybe a little bit more so than before? Like him doing this all in his first two years, I think is maybe the biggest conversation piece that is kind of missing out on the whole thing. Yeah, I think it took me uh, probably late into my second year um, before I felt comfortable in that offense. I mean, there were times I, I laugh and I was telling I was telling Bill this too because I'm sure he knew we were playing the Cowboys in one game in that year, and Steve the Bird was just getting plastered. I mean, every down. And so as the game went on, Bill started substituting, and so if this was Bill, I was standing right behind him, and as he turned, I turned right behind him, so he couldn't see me. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had one in that game. <laughs> hold on, hold on. We're talking. We're talking about the sideline antics. Didn't you call your wife? One time from the sideline phone, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I called her a bunch of times after that, but I, one time I was just sitting there, and I think I think it was in L.A. It was the first time. We were, I was sitting there, and we were winning, and I was going, wow, I, let me see if, if I hit nine, like any other place, right? You, you get an outside line, and I got an outside line. So I dialed up my house, and she answered the phone. I said, hey, what are you doing? She goes, I'm watching the game. What are you, wait, what are you doing? What are you call me for? I go, I just thought I'd check and see if this phone worked and uh, if it dialed out and it did. So I thought I'd call and say, hey, love you. Got to go. Got to go back to work. <laughs> you're the coolest dude of all time. You're, you're, and obviously being from Pittsburgh, it's great to know that. Tone Diggs, also from Plum, has a question for you. Yeah, I do, Joe. I wanted to ask you about being there and, and on a lot of the greats, you know, Unitas, Namath, Blanda, Jim Kelly, Marino. What? what? 
and then there's some others who aren't in the Hall of Fame but were still great quarterbacks. Why do you think being from Western PA, especially around that time, like created so many great quarterbacks? You know, I, I, I get asked this a lot, and I really don't have an answer other than I think that such a blue-collar area, hardworking, yeah. um, sports was everything. Um, I know that um, you know, I played three sports all the way through high school, and mainly because my mom and dad knew they couldn't afford to send me to a college that, you know, of any uh, named college, so to speak. And um, it was a way out of, you know, we had coal uh, mine in our town. We had two steel mills along the, the river right by us. And, you know, it, it was, it was a blue collar. And I think that it was just a hardworking area. You were taught to work hard and, and, um, and at that point in time, you know, I think, I don't know. I think maybe it was the Iron City beer. I don't yeah. know. Hey, <laughs> I, I, know see. I don't really have an answer on how, how that it came that the quarter, all those quarterbacks came out of there. Um, I just know that i um, very competitive, all of them. Um, I've been friends with everybody, uh, Danny and Jim and uh, Unitas before he passed away and, and, and Namath. So it's. It's a fun group to be associated with. I know that. Yeah. Well, we're all lucky that you. I don't have an answer. (laughs) Well, you just gave the answer. I think you did give the answer. I think it was uh, just like every other generation of Pittsburghers. Whenever you're in high school and you're underage, you can certainly find Iron City or Ice sure. Light, you know, whatever yeah. you need it. And uh, a little bit of river water will make you feel good. Have you tried? They got Icy Light Mango, I think. Oh, yeah. They got an Icy Light Mango. Oh, it's yeah. Delightful, Joe. Del- hey. Very good. Oh. Delightful, Joe. Actually. I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to give it a try Do you? after my Guinness. Oh, you're a, you're a Guinness guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing Guinness now for a while. I felt I we were... We were over in Ireland with the girls were, and this is the craziest story. It's like, it actually was cheaper to buy jumping horses in Europe, ship them back home than it is to buy them here. The, uh, like actual jumping horses you're talking about? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like the equestrian jumpers. You're in that world. Your family's in that world. I didn't know that. Well, they, well, we were for a while with the girls. And so we were over there and, um, our trainer, um, he said to me, Hey, when the girls are done jumping, we're going we're gonna to go get us a pint. And I'm going, again, he goes a pint of Guinness. And I'm going, oh, okay, man. All right, I guess, you know, I wasn't really had much Guinness to that point, but wow. So first he goes and he comes back. He goes, I'll go sit down. I'll come, I'll get it. And he comes back and I go, well, where's the beer? He goes, well, no, you got to wait for it. And I go, what do you mean you got to wait for it? He goes, yeah, special way to pour it. And after the first one, every day, about the same time, I go, Charlie, isn't it? Isn't it about time for a pint? So, <laughs> <laughs> but a bit, but I've been with Guinness ever since. It's been a while. We yeah. Just, we just saw a photo of you with your Guinness gear on. Boy, oh, looks so cool. It looks so sweet. You're certified <laughs> pour. I actually got the cer- uh, certificate to oh. pour the pint, the whole thing. I did that over there. Uh, you know what? I learned a trick too this time. We were just over in Ireland for the Notre Dame uh, Navy game, so we went and visited the what do they call it? They don't call it the brewery. Um, factory the gatehouse or something like that and it's like 14 stories and the guy showed me a trick on the end you know how you're not supposed to have any bubbles yeah how to get rid of the bubble if you have a bubble it's pretty sweet so what is so it, now joe? i got it so tell me what the hell is it joe i'd like i think we should yeah. all know right this. at the end if you see a little bubble you just tilt it up and pour right over top of the bubble just to oh. drop ah oh, so you're combating the bubble almost you're like alphaing the bubble yeah. guinness is delightful yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. it is a great taste yeah, delicious. how many are we have are you putting uh are you putting shots of uh are you doing car bombs with those things as well joe? Uh, <clears throat> Every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Joe. Yep. We love that. Con man's got a question for you, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Now yep. it feels like in the NFL, everyone obviously wants their franchise QB. And then once that franchise QB is on, you know, the last leg of their career, they want the next guy. And we saw it with the Packers yeah. for, you know, Brett Favre to Rodgers and then Rodgers to now Jordan Love, who's unbelievable. And you kind of had to deal with that with Steve Young a little bit. When you are that guy at a place for so long, how is that transition as the front man when you know, like, hey, there is someone behind me that they obviously want to be the guy someday? And, you know, how do you think that was handled with Sam Frank? Because obviously the Jimmy G to Trey Lance worked in a different way, obviously, because of Brock. Yeah. Uh, Well, my transition, I think, was a little different than most, um, mainly because 
we had won two Super Bowls in a row. Well, when I got hurt in the championship game, we were winning. When I left the game, is all I say. And <laughs> we'll probably have one of the best statistical years that I, uh, that I'd had. So in a lot of cases, you know, you you, sh- you should get your job back. But um, I don't know. George had made a transition while I was hurt, and he didn't want to transition back out, and he wanted me to be the backup. And I said. Uh, I'm better than he is, and I don't, I don't want to be behind him. I shouldn't be behind him. So, and then I even said, put two salaries on the table and let us compete. And if I lose, I'll stay. And he said, no. So, so well, I'm not staying under those circumstances. I'll, I want to play. I want to be on the field. I want to finish my career on the field. I don't want to be here on the bench. When I know, I, if I knew I couldn't play, different story. But I knew I could play still. You and Steve have any heat for that? Any beef for that long term or? No, I mean, anytime you're in a competition with somebody, it's not always the closest of friendships. I mean, we're friends, but um, and it's a, it was a working relationship. My job, as I always say, when they, they said, how did you help Steve? I go, I didn't help Steve. My job was to make sure that Steve stayed right where he was behind me. That's my job. <laughs> they and talk about that I'm now. Doing my job. They, Excuse they, me? they still talk about that now whenever there's like a veteran in this position. Yeah. It's not just quarterback. They're always like, this person needs to teach this young person how to take their job. And you, everything. Teach, you do teach to a certain degree, but it's one of those things that, that there's so much to do yourself that it's really hard to sit there during a game or during practice to where you you got it. I mean, your constant your, the concentration that takes place from the day you start practice of the, in the middle of the week or like for us. We had we came in on Monday, had Tuesday off, started Wednesday. So from Wednesday through Sunday, it was a grind. You know, it was hard enough to get myself ready to try to try to get somebody else ready too. But not that you if he if he asked me questions, yeah, for sure I could help join that. But for the most part, I'm concentrating on getting myself ready for the game. Speaking of getting yourself ready, and obviously you played a long time and. Hey, still able to spin that. Oh, yeah. Did you do any, uh, what was your, like, uh, because obviously food science and nutrition and everything has kind of changed over the years and evolved as we've learned more about the human body and foods and everything like that. Because, forgive me if this was the era before you, but we've seen the videos (laughs) of people smoking, you know, Uh NFL guys smoking (laughs) and things like that. Like, how did you take care of your body back then? And what was it like versus what you see nowadays in the NFL? Oh, it's a lot different. Um, I just had a simple lifting routine, very simple, till I got to Kansas City, and, the, and then Marty made me lift five days a week, and he made somebody go with me to make sure I didn't cheat, and I went from 192 pounds to 208. Jeez. And he wondered why I, got, I was running out of, of bounds, and some guy clipped my foot, and I tore my hamstring. And he said, I thought you were faster than that. I said, I was at 192, but not at 208. <laughs> yeah, you but, uh, back, back then, yeah, back then, yeah, we had guys that smoked in the locker room. We had, um, we, but for me, I was pretty simple. I got up, like pregame was get up, go to the uh, check in to breakfast, take a little tiny piece of, a couple bites of steak just to get my stomach so it wasn't full. Halftime, I had a Snickers. And after the game, I had a double cheeseburger. <laughs> it's in the locker. So, <laughs> day, what's your game day routine? Well, I just need a couple pieces of steak. Uh-huh. I need that Snickers. Yeah. Need that Snickers. Yeah. And then yeah. afterwards, yeah. double yeah. cheeseburger yeah. stat pronto. And the, or the body yeah. won't show up next week. Um, I think <laughs> you're obviously so synonymous with the Niners because of the multiple Super Bowls. And you just brought up getting to the Chiefs. And we looked up, uh, I th- we think you were 8-3 and three and then 9-5, and five, had a couple injuries, but made it to the AFC Championship. Do you keep in touch with the Chiefs program at all? Because this is kind of a Joe Montana Bowl yeah. here mm-hmm. that's happening in the Super Bowl. And what are your thoughts on mm-hmm. where they are right now? They're in the middle of a dynasty run, much like you guys were. Yeah, they, they definitely are. You know, they've got – I mean, and that was kind of part of the reason I went there. Um, after looking around, uh, there were some com- places that I could have gone also. But you look at the organization, it was similar to what I was used to here in San Francisco. Uh, the support from the team – the support from the the um, the fans are is absolutely ridiculous. If you ever played in Kansas City, yes. yeah. it's insane. And um, but it was just a great transition. They had, we had a really good defense, 
and we had a really good offensive line. We had some what I wasn't really, really used to was some little fast guys on the outside that could fly. I had to I'd outrun my arm all the time. I thought, guys, <laughs> yeah, I got to get this up as fast as I can get it in the air. But um, <clears throat> the transition was was great. The people were great. You know, we had lived in a great neighborhood right on the golf course there. And so, um, yeah, we, it was it was a fun place to play. Yeah. Very fun. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we – we made a mistake in that last game in last season where we had to go to Buffalo uh, for the championship game and we had beaten them already once in, earlier in the year. And uh, it was 50 degrees and sunshine in Kansas city, but that wasn't the case. And yeah, well, yeah. home field advantage matters. <laughs> home field advantage matters. Oh my gosh. And I couldn't, I couldn't throw the ball from here to my window right there. And it was in and for the any consistency, light rain, drizzle, wind, cold. It was like, yeah, <laughs> Everything I hate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pittsburgh guy, you know, yeah. but mm-hmm. you go over to California for a while, things start to get a little bit different over there in North Carolina. <laughs> change. Ty has a question for you, Joe. Yeah, Joe, before Bill Belichick, you know, a lot of people would say that, hey, Bill Walsh is arguably the greatest coach of all times. And you play for him, and then obviously in Kansas City, play for Marty Schottenheimer. Right now, the coaching uh, cycle is kind of complete, and we're seeing all these teams go with young, offensive minded guys. Are you surprised that a guy like Bill Belichick is kind of left out and he's not, you know, with only being 15 wins away from the career record? Like, are, are you surprised that the league is skewing much younger and going offensive and a guy like Bill Belichick and Pete Carroll are kind of just left in this game of musical chairs and they're not going to be coaching a team next year? Um, I can say yes and I can say no, but for the most part, I, it doesn't surprise me at all anything in the NFL – these days, I mean, they're um, they're always looking for the next best thing. And I think when you when Bill came along, he brought some a new type of system um, that people have added on to a lot that made a lot of sense. And I think that's was his big advantage at that point. And that's what they're looking for now. The game's changed. It's not the same as when Pete first started or or Belichick first started. And they're looking for those guys who, you know, live in that world right now. And uh, quarterback position is different. Um, so I, I'm not surprised. I mean, yeah, it would be nice to see them catch on somewhere, but I'm not surprised that it's happening. No, finally, to the coaches who are doing it to everybody, they're getting it now. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like the way you're viewing that. A um, couple <laughs> questions here before we let you go and. This has been so cool. I just want to let you know that. Yeah. As a, uh, I took a 23 and me. I'm 0.01 percent Italian, so uh, you know, as a Western <laughs> Pennsylvania Italian American, this is a real, a real dream come true. How do you feel about where the NFL is right now? You know, a lot of the olds that are around the NFL back in the day, soft, this, that, all the different changes have been made. It's not still football. The ratings are higher than ever. The amount of money that's coming into the league is bigger and better than ever. What are your thoughts on the state of the NFL and of football whenever you watch it, Joe? I I think it's great. I mean, the game itself is, when you know, it's it's a Sunday afternoon is nothing like a Sunday afternoon. And being out there and getting – the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of the game and the adrenaline rushes that happen. And there's, it's still fun to watch. And the game, if you look at the game from when I always, why Jennifer always hates when I say this, well, well, when I played, because she always says, why does everybody have to say that? But back when I played, there were guys who played before me that I, if I watched their, their tapes, um, I would say the same thing. Wow. The game has changed a lot compared to that i mean even in some cases the ball shape has even changed <laughs> to, to where it is today but and it, it's all they're always looking for a way to make the game better now they're and, and now if, uh, finally they're starting to try to make it a little bit safer i still would like to see them hit the quarterback but just don't compress them in the ground we should be able to get hit like anybody else but the problem i have with the, that is that we we get hit by a guy who outweighs you by 100 150 well 150 pounds. <coughs> Excuse me. It's okay. Hey. Oh, it's right. Take your time, Joe. Jeez, Joe. Take your time. You cannot have you choking. Up. You know what I mean? You, yeah, you gather your breath. Have, we already got enough people have, attacking uh, us, Joe. Uh-huh. We already got enough. I know. People. I have two. Yeah, we have two. Uh, we we have three grandkids and super spreaders. So I got something. <laughs> from you. 
<laughs> and uh, well, we hope you're all right. They, uh, but yeah, I think that I, I just think that they should be part of the game more of that and be able to feel the hit. <laughs> just don't compress them. Yeah, and like I think Tom Brady says the same thing. I think Aaron Rodgers says the same thing. I think everybody that is potentially Mount Rushmore, Peyton's. I think mm-hmm. I think everybody that's on the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks. There's like five to six guys I think that are kind of on everybody's list. When that starts happening and your name starts getting brought up into that, as a dude who's from coal mining, steel mill town, you know, playing sports, just hoping to get to college. Is there a, is that a whirlwind of emotion whenever people start saying like, hey, this guy's like greatest of all time to ever play the sport that literally all of America loves? Like, when did that start happening for you? And what was kind of the emotions of that that came alongside of that? Well, I think it started happening you know, right after I retired. And um, but it it's a great feeling to to know that people you know still think that of you and and what you did and because <clears throat> while you you're out there. You play for yourself. You also play for your fans. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, don't worry. Sorry for asking you another question. After that. I thought you would beat it. I thought you would beat it. Can we get Joe some water over there? <laughs> Come on. Can we get Joe some water over there? Call the house phone. Jeez, yeah. Use the sideline phone. Please. Holding it off too. I've been fighting it for about ten, since we started here. Hey, that's <laughs> impressive yeah. grit. That's yeah. good grit. That's the uh... Pittsburgh. But yeah, no. I mean, it's it's a great feeling to know that people still think that about you and and still consider you in that in that group um, uh, I played like I always say I played a stupid game for a living that I loved and I was I was very lucky well you're fantastic at it and you inspired a lot of us especially Pittsburgh kids so mm-hmm. we appreciate you keep going enjoy this upcoming week in Super Bowl and can't wait to see you get a nice sip of water Joe I uh, know me too <laughs> get <laughs> hey I'll see you soon man All right, take care. See you guys. Have a good one. Appreciate you having me on. Hey, thank you for joining us. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Montana. Yeah, Joe! There ain't nothing like that where it's just sitting there. It's the worst. It's so bad. Especially in this particular profession. Yeah, you Uh can't, don't feel like you can cough because everyone will hear it no matter what. Or see, yeah. It's Uh a whole thing. And right now, I think everybody at some point Mm -hmm. is dealing with some sort of, Oh yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is. We're all going to have it when we come back from Vegas. That is without a doubt. So I was in St. Pete. Bud. Then Indy. Bud. Then Tampa for Raw. Bud. Then back to Indy. And I like woke up on Tuesday morning and it was just like, uh, ah, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And then I like search. I'm like, what is this? And they're like, ah, oh, everybody on earth has it. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay. Sweet. All right, good. What do we need? Just some water, some Mucinex, some stuff like that. But I couldn't even imagine old Joe Montana for like 15 minutes just being like, mm-hmm. I hate this. I got no water around me either. <laughs> And they got to be on this full screen the entire time whenever I'm talking. He's a legend, dude. Yeah. Didn't even get a chance to ask him about throwing a football at uh, somebody's face. Shit. Night. And saving his grandkid. But I believe he's going to be, I think there's a chance he's in Vegas next week as okay. well. So we might see Joe Montana again. Remember, we saw him a couple years ago, Radio Row, yep. walking through, had the camera phone. Joe, holy shit. Yeah. That's Joe Montana. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to get to Radio Row next week. I know. Mm-hmm. It's going to be awesome. Legitimately. Mm-hmm. I, I think the, the people that are going to be at Radio Row on Wednesday... Like, I think Antonio Pierce is going to be there. Oh, okay. Ooh. I think. I think Shannon Sharp's going to be there. What? Okay. I think Dana White's going to be there. Right. And we have a pretty good relationship with all the people that are there. So I think there's a pretty good chance that they're probably going to swing by the mm-hmm. set. And then it's like Thursday, I think, is absolutely jam-packed. And I think I even heard, like, the cake boss. No, <laughs> no, no, no way. Yeah, like, for there's those, no chance. For those of you who have been following along for our our show for a long time, obviously you know how absurd Radio Row is and how ridiculous the shows are there. Everything from the Brett Favre lawsuit announcement to mm-hmm. who's the magician in the middle of the thing doing an absurd trick to Carrot Top coming in. T- Yep. Trying out new material. Exactly. Radio Row has been absurd. For those that are very new to uh, our show, think about how dumb and ADD we are. And then think about Radio Row just being filled with mm-hmm. everything that's everything. So many people. The fact mm-hmm. that ESPN has not gone to Radio Row it's wild. is wild to me. It's bold. Like, we're the first, I think, in a long time, I think we're the first daytime show that's going to be in Radio Row. Like, the NFL people that set up Radio Row were, like, pretty pumped. Like, oh, okay, thank you guys. for Had to create space mm-hmm. for a stage because uh, how it's all packed in there. But it's like, I'm very excited for this particular platform that we're very lucky to be on and have, this one down here. 
It's like, wait and see. Radio Row is the Super Bowl. <clears throat> oh, yeah. yeah. That is the Super Bowl. Like, I get the Super Bowl, the game is happening, and everybody talks about that. But whenever they chat about all the festivities and everything that's happening, it's like Radio Row. Mm -hmm. That's where all the companies that are associated yep. with the NFL have a stand. That's where basically every player, legend, celebrity every, is just going through yep. there. Oh, yeah. And we just... We have a blast. Good time. Yeah. We so have an fun. absolute blast in there. So I'm very excited for not only what this week was, shout out to Joe for finishing up and wrapping up a phenomenal week whenever it comes to NFL quarterbacks. And we have Jim Harbaugh joining us next hour. But like next week should be bananas. And it's it becomes very good football talk because the minds that are just walking around, mm -hmm. and obviously they're, I'm here to sell Old Spice. Mm -hmm. My armpits love Old Spice. I don't smell when I use Old Spice. And then as soon as you're able to, all right, sweet. We love old Shout out yeah, old yeah. Go. yeah. And then once you get in there, it's like all these people have been paying attention to what's been going on and they have opinions. And just like Joe, like Joe doesn't talk a lot. Mm -hmm. So like at Radio Row, it's the first time hearing a lot of these people speak. It's a dream. It is an absolute dream. I'm pumped that we've made it to this part of the season, but I'm also pretty bummed out about it. We only got one game that matters left high. Yeah, for sure. But you always say, like, I mean, it is kind of nice how going down there is just like a culmination and like a year-end celebration for kind of all the hard work and everything you've put in to get up to this point. And, it's, I mean, not so much anymore now that we're on ESPN, but it kind of used to be like when we'd go to Radio Row, it's like, hey, realistically, like this is – being down here is the only chance we're going to get to talk to X person. Like, we have no way of getting this person on the show if it's not at Radio Row, pitching, whatever it is. And honestly, most of the times, like every once in a while, you'll get one where it's like everything goes back to the product. But a lot of times when we have these people on, like, they'll end up just – not really even talking about yeah. what they're supposed to be there and like the their I have to exactly it's mm -hmm. like hey and what were you pitching again like I mean Sean Payton last year like he stayed for 30 minutes care. and didn't give a rat's ass about what he was supposed to be talking about you know he just wanted to talk about football he's awesome. great at Radio Row yeah he is fantastic I hope he's back I yeah. assume he's not because he's got a lot to do up in Denver but yeah there's and then we learn about people that watch our show mm -hmm. and they're like excited to get on yep and then once they get on, they're like, here we go. Matt Patricia, when he was the head coach <laughs> oh. of the Detroit Lions, oh, yeah. was not supposed to be at Radio Row. Okay, He was just doing the Super Bowl pretty much. I don't, meetings, I think, were happening. Hey, he only came to Radio Row to do our show. But he, he didn't bring his – I don't think he had his wallet, nope. his, his phone, his credential, yeah. nothing. Yeah. So trying to get a head coach of the NFL into Radio Row became a full part of our show pretty much. And then he joined us. He just sat for 40 minutes just mm -hmm. chit-chatting about whatever. Drew Brees, the same thing. And I missed him last year, so I hope we get a chance mm -hmm. to see each other again. It's mm -hmm. like – um, the NFL does it right whenever they do the Super Bowl, and next week should be absolutely bananas. So we appreciate you all for following along this season. Just know that next week is normally our most absurd week. Everything that we have done thus far, whether you loved it, hated it, said wow or boom, what, Whoa. any of those things, next week will be the most absurd mm -hmm. by far. Yeah. It, it is not even a question mark. Yeah, it, like you think about the places that we've been, at least these last couple of years, Arizona and L.A., and both those places definitely lifted up because they're destinations, but – I don't think anything can touch Vegas. Nope. Like when we're talking about de destination places for Super Bowls, everyone's going to go, mm -hmm. obviously, because it's Vegas. You just add that Super Bowl aspect to it. It's going to be nuts. Ty in Miami, you remember our desk was the size of the toxic table. Legit. <laughs> the whole Maybe. show. That's I don't not even know hyperbole. if it's that big. Yeah, it was legitimately this big. Like I actually was watching a clip the other day. It's like, I think we had the McCordy twins on. It wasn't big enough. Like Diggs had it had to get up and, and leave because the desk four wide. Yeah, was we're not... four wide on a two wide desk. Yep. And uh, I I do believe I actually you know took a picture and said here we are this particular year. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. And now uh, I think the set that ESPN built this year. I'm excited yeah. to see it. <laughs> yeah, pumped. It's pretty cool, man. Hey, we made it, boys. Yep. Oh yeah. Team on three, team on me. One, two, three. Team. team. Proud of you guys. Cliff Kingsbury hired as the Raiders offense coordinator. This Ooh. is big news. Now, Cliff Kingsbury is known for a lot of things. He's ridiculously handsome. Mm -hmm. Like, really handsome. Super cool looking. Always dresses cool. Yep. We know that his dad is a Marine from Texas. Ooh, raw! And we know that he loves ball. Yep. We got to learn a little bit more about him, though, from A.Q. Shipley, who has obviously played for a lot of teams, a lot of quarterbacks, a lot of systems. And we got a chance to hear his thoughts on what Cliff Kingsbury is whenever he was interviewing with the Steelers at the time. Now he's got the Raiders offense coordinator job. I think Raider Nation's going to want to hear this from A.Q. Shipley. He's exactly what you want. You want to basically infuse the new age scheme into that Pittsburgh Steelers locker room. They haven't had it in years. And He's so good. I mean, I, there were so many times he would come up to us and be like, hey, man, I, this is what I do. I get guys open. And when you turn on his tape, 
there's guys open all over the field. Former quarterback, obviously incredibly mm-hmm. handsome. Yep. Father and Marine. Boom! Oh, oh, he's from it. Texas. Just loves ball and looks cool all Grind. the time. So cool. I mean, he's in he's in there at three thirty in the morning, all the time. Ooh, really? Damn. Yeah, he's a grinder. I don't think anybody talks about that about mm-hmm. Cliff because how cool he looks. Mm-hmm. You're saying he's in, he's in there early, getting his workout in. He's watching tape by four fifteen. Jeez. Oh, okay, yeah. Cliff. Cliff. Didn't know that about Cliff. Obviously, Dad Marine from. Th- yeah. Of course. Makes no. sense. Should have known this from the beginning. Yeah, so we probably didn't need to tail end of that particular video there of me just reiterating everything that I said at the beginning of this entire thing. <laughs> but it needs to be noted because when you see him, you think, look at this little pretty boy, little baby bitch, maybe. Mm-hmm. But no, this guy, like, hardworking dog mm-hmm. who was obviously escalated quickly through the ranks, going from Texas Tech to USC for about a week, and then now he's the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. For one reason or another, it doesn't end up working out, even though they won more games each and every year, got in the playoffs, won 11 games with that entire situation, with what we've learned behind the scenes about the building and how it was all running at the time. Almost seems like it's a modern miracle that it took place. Yeah. But with Antonio Pierce setting the tone and Cliff Kingsbury as offense coordinator, who's going to be throwing it? We don't know, but it feels like they got it right over there. Yeah, at least like culture-wise. Like I feel like especially with some of these teams in New England, you could even say is one of them. Like if you have the right staff, in there that feels like the first step and then the quarterback and everything else will get settled but I mean I believe they're keeping their special teams coordinator too like a lot of the stuff has been in-house they're keeping the same DC so Cliff is really like the only new face in there and from what AQ said he's perfect yeah I love it yeah. I like that the Raiders have a little baby face turn happening as well people are going to get behind them yeah. because of an underdog story mm-hmm. situation but they're still in a big bad wolf's division they- and they know that mm-hmm. Tom Telesco new GM has built up a great roster I think Jim Harbaugh has even acknowledged the roster that Tom Telesco built up over there in Los Angeles for the Chargers. Think about Antonio Pierce. His first year of head coaching, he has to go against, in his division, Jim Harbaugh, Sean Payton, and, and then Andy Reid. Like three three all-time coaches Antonio Pierce has to go up against in, in his first year coaching, which is it's, it's insane. And it's, it's nice that he has I saw Marvin Lewis is going to be the mm-hmm. assistant head coach, which is huge. He could always go to him to ask questions. Cliff's been a head coach. Um it's it Coughlin's in his ear like he has a bunch of head coaches to go but going against those three in the division it's insane yeah he's gonna be great and it feels like he embodies everything that the Raiders are I feel like he's gonna have a you know a lot of opportunity with that team to build his culture and put his culture into place I feel like Davis is probably gonna be a bit more patient with mm-hmm. everything they got going on and the boys in the locker room the pillars all seemingly love them good for the Raiders figure now also before the hour one ends Mark Andrews was a part of saving a life yesterday. Yes, he was. Baltimore Ravens tight end uh, was a part of saving somebody's life because of a blood sugar situation that happened uh, on a plane. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Mark Andrews. That a baby? Yeah, love you, Mark. Fast acting. Mm -hmm. He said it wasn't him, obviously. It was everybody else, which leads in even more so. Thank you, Mark right. Andrews, you. representing Mark. the league. There's a lot of great humans that represent the NFL. We're lucky to chit-chat with a lot of them. Remember, negativity can hog publicities, but there's a lot of positive out there. We just got to continue to look for it. In the next hour, A.J. Hawk will join us. So will Jim Harbaugh. This is going to be a beautiful feel-good Friday. Be a friend, tell a friend something nice. Take three. Three. Coming back to get a chance to be in front of the WWE Universe is an absolute honor. I was told, hey, Pat, you want to come back and commentate? I said, hell yes. Biggest WrestleMania Let's go. Royal Rumble, what an event. What a spectacular situation where stories can be written, where dreams can come true. You want to commentate? I said, hell yeah. Work with Michael Cole, the greatest of all time, alongside Corey Graves, a fresh baby. I said, I would love to do that. Just telling Cole how happy I am that you're back. That's awesome of you. Very nice of you. All I can hear is these people saying my name. I love the WWE Universe. And then all of a sudden, what, 22? I'm, I'm in the Royal Rumble? <laughs> Nobody gave me a up about that. I got my cowboy boots on. Hey. Let's go. What? Good luck. Go ahead, buddy. What are you, what are you, you came to ruin my night and get in the Rumble? You're in the Rumble match. Go. You can win the thing. You can go to WrestleMania. Get him made him at WrestleMania. Get him, Pat. Come on, Pat. Go get him. Get him. You can made him at WrestleMania. You, baby. You got this. And then there was a thing in there. 
seven foot three. You're just looking up at a statue of a bee, and I see little Braun Breaker go rrr, 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 like barking at me. I'm like, I'm not supposed to be in here. Why would I be in here right now? I'm not prepared for this. And also, who would I be to take a main event at WrestleMania spot away from somebody? So I got my ass out of there. Now I went back in because I thought to myself, wait a minute, am I just gonna be a coward? And then I realized quickly, yeah, I think tonight I am. And I went right back to the booth. Pat Maxey maybe he needs to stay on college game day and stay the hell away from me. That's all I gotta say about that. Maybe you should go back to punting or something. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of reiterating that with both his mouth and his eyes. That man oozes an intensity that I wasn't re I wasn't prepared for, to be honest with you. I'm having a good time down here. St. Pete, good weather, got sunburned today. I don't know if you saw it. I took all the sun that is in St. Pete on my face. I'm talking to Michael Cole. I'm watching history. And then all of a sudden, I got Brum Breaker looking at me as if I'm some piece of meat like he wants to bite me. I don't want that. Brum Breaker got 23 miles an hour off the ropes, and now he's gonna stare at me? I don't think so. I didn't even have my gear on. You know what I mean? I was kind of caught off guard there. Got to be prepared for anything, I guess, especially in WWE. But overall, tonight was awesome. It was great to be back. My schedule is awesome, wild, busy. Plus, gorgeous little baby girl, beautiful bride. So trying to balance everything has certainly been a thing. But anytime I get the opportunity to work alongside the geniuses and greats that are in the WWE, I'm certainly going to make the most of it and take advantage of the opportunity because this is a dream come true. So who knows what's next, but it will be something. We've got some breaking news tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as we kick off Monday Night Raw. Pat, I promised you we'd have one more run together. Yes. It's going to happen. Pat and I will be the new commentary team here on Monday Night Raw every week going forward. I can't wait. I'm lucky to be sitting next to the GOAT one last time at least, and let's enjoy this ride, baby. The following program is a collection of stooges talking about happenings in the sports world. It is meant to be comedic informative. The opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect the beliefs of their peers, their boss, or ESPN. There may be some cuss words because that's how humans in the real world talk. If you are young, please seek permission before watching any further. Hey, why? Let's go! This show stinks, and the fact that you listen, we are very, very thankful for it. The all-time leading tackler for the Green Bay Packers. You pig! Damn it! <laughs> Your friend tell a friend something nice could change their life. We want that! We want that! Sport! 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 Hello, beautiful people, and welcome back to our humble abode, the Thunderdome, on this feel-good Friday, February 2nd, 2024. Hour two of the program starts now! Football is wonderful, as is golf. Right now on the Top Golf app, whenever you book through that, you get half off Top Golf Monday through Wednesday at select locations, which I think is all of them except for the Vegas one. Yep. Okay. Now, I haven't looked into all the Top Golfs because they are everywhere, but I do believe the Las Vegas one is the only one where this particular offer is not available. Go through the Top Golf app, book the Top Golf Bay. It's half off Monday through Wednesday. Shout out to Top Golf. We appreciate the hell. Hopefully, get to see you out of Vegas next week. Yeah. Yeah. The wait. talks the table here at Boston Connor and at Ty Schmidt. One half of the hammer, Don. Cowboys turn Diggs is here. And joining us live from an attic in Ohio is a cigar smoking, college football championship winning, Super Bowl champion having, what? COVID survivor, president of Ohio, ladies and gentlemen, the all-time leading tackler for the Green Bay Packers, A.J. Hawk. Yeah. A.J., how many tackles does the second place have behind you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know how they uh, how they do that, or who keeps track of anything. Like, are you are, are we safe? No, uh, I, unfortunately, I do have bad news. He, he isn't safe because I know Quay Walker was yeah. a tackle away last year, and I do believe Quay Walker once again had another great year as far as tackles go. Yeah, so, so he broke the Packers' rookie record his rookie year. I mean, it, it all depends. It depends on how long he plays there. Boom, you know. But Quay Walker is. He's a good player. He's that dude can wear. fly. He's hot on his he heels. He can fly. I wouldn't say he's hot on his heels, but okay. he's, he's coming. Okay. Uh, Zito just put this up on the back wall and said, I have no idea if this is right. So that's good. Uh, 629 tackles. Is that accurate, AJ? Is that what you have? No, none of these tackles are even remotely accurate. Okay. okay sweet. I Happy guarantee you Nick Barnett up. probably has close to uh, – Nick Barnett has 900 and something. 
So it combined, it has AJ at nine. Tacos are just stupid. It has AJ at nine twenty-two and Barnett at seven eighty-nine. Oh, so this is just probably solo. So, solo. Yeah. So you had six hundred and twenty-nine solo tackles Jeez. for the Green Bay Packers. Tackles That's are a very uh, subjective stat at times. I think. Well, they it's certainly good. are, and obviously we talked uh, talked about that with TJ Watt and JJ Watt this yep. year as it came into account because I think TJ a couple years ago had a record, and then they actually halved one of his mm -hmm. to say no, 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 and they're like, well, who is making that decision? AJ, you made no Pro Bowl throughout your career, I don't think anybody was doing you any favors ever, pal. I don't think anybody... Yeah, I would assume that maybe that number should be... I assume you got screwed what, out of a few. Yeah. I, I don't know how it works, honestly. Tackles between the... Like every player knows, like on defense, the NFL has tackle stats, and then the team has tackle stats. Usually... The team is more accurate, but you know sometimes some coaches may give you a couple JOPs and count them as tackles. I enjoyed uh, Tom McMahon would uh, you know because the stats would come back in, in the kicking and punting world. They're pretty matter of fact, you know, like hey, here's the stats, here's the stats. And then if I had like a good weekend but not my best or whatever, he would say, but how about these stats, pal, that aren't being talked about? Field position, when they, where they started, what their drive start average was, what it wasn't, how ball tra how long travel in air hang time-wise versus everybody else. He's like, we're all good to go. It's like, well, thank you for making up stats to make me feel good. Great. I think that's what you're saying about potential coaches and stats when it comes to tackles, which means life is good. Speaking of life being good, how about Joe Montana being on the show in the first hour, AJ Hawk? This was a phenomenal week, a bananas week, uh, like actually, AJ. Absolutely. I mean, Joe was great. He exceeded any expectation I had for him, and I knew he would be awesome. It's unfortunate that we couldn't get to the, uh, you know, to confirm the story of him throwing the football and hitting the bird or the kidnapper and sliding down the banister, catching his young grand baby, boy or girl, we are not sure, kicking the guy, stepping on his neck, mm -hmm. calling 911, and never even breaking a sweat all while wearing probably some sweet, like, button down pajamas. It looks amazing. And That's also, there's skinny sketchers. Oh, yeah. He's got oh, those, yeah. those sketchers. Yeah. Guinness, on the other hand, probably, put a, probably chugged probably his Guinness while he was sliding down the banister. Oh, oh I didn't even yeah. think about that, but now that yeah. we know him a little bit better. Yeah. Yep. Probably did. Yeah. You're, he was probably pouring the perfect pint. Wow. <laughs> wow. No bubble. Put a little drop right on put top of that Put a little drop on top, too. grabs the thing, slides down. Sketcher's so big, he doesn't even fall off the banister. It's just like a walk-off. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can escalate Catch the baby. Pose on top of person, drink, call, yeah. Still got it. What a legend. As the cops came in, that's what they saw. Joe yeah. posing while he's chugging his Guinness. Well, it was an empty pint at that point. Right. Uh-huh. Right. The, the pint. Third or this is how long I've been yeah. waiting for you. What took you so long, boys? <laughs> yeah. You know? And the uh, Skechers, bottom of the Skechers had little chew marks, obviously, on it. Yep. Because at that point, <laughs> where he was. Mm -hmm. That guy was trying to get up. Stepping right on the kidnapper's yeah. face, mm -hmm. obviously. But that's yeah. why the Skechers has the big. <laughs> that's, yeah. why, that's why they had the shape up. That's, that's right. why they actually yeah. made the shape ups. Smart. Uh <laughs> Glad we got that figured out. If that was going to be the final question, mm -hmm. and then the universe wow. attacked his throat, yeah, and was yeah, like, he, he "We don't need to know yeah. the truth." I thought you might be going after the truth. truth. Yeah, the world. I thought you might have said. I thought, even though I, I could see your brain work, like, "Oh, he's uh, he's coughing. He probably can't say too much." Oh, okay, mate, I gotta ask him though. I gotta confirm the story, and then you're like, "Oh, man, uh, we'll get it." Man, I hope yeah, we'll yeah, hopefully. Can't kill Joe Montana. No. no. If this show killed Joe Montana, boy. <laughs> no, no. Call it. Can't it, come back from that. You, nope. No way. People were hoping that would happen. I, I, I heard. I, I could sense. Spirits. <laughs> yeah, I could people sense casting people spells. Hoping, oh, yeah. Joe Montana. Yeah. Joe Montana's never going to die. No. I don't know how to tell people that. He's never going to die. When I did run into him when we were on vacation, first of all, me and the wife looked at each other and we're like, we're vacationing in the same spot as Joe Montana. Pretty sweet. Nice. Mm -hmm. Pretty sweet. Nice little handshake. And then as I'm watching him, I, I, I feel like I probably look like a little seven-year-old. And there were some people at that resort who happened to know of my existence as well. So I thought about them watching me watch Joe a couple different times. And I'm like, man, I have to look like such an asshole right now. But I just couldn't, I just couldn't help it. Like literally as soon as I saw him, it was just like a gravitational pull. Like, sir. And that was when uh, Brett was suing me. Yep. Yeah. So uh, he, had, he had learned about me, I think, through that entire thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people read the New York Post article that had the entire lawsuit mm -hmm. in it. And to be clear, it's about a year ago now. Um, the things they put in that lawsuit were some of my best shit. Oh, you yeah. know, like oh, some yeah. of my best tweets that I've ever, you know, like. Yeah. You know, like. Some, you mean it was all typed up for you in a document? And it was cool to see, it, you know, in a legal forum? Yeah, obviously, we said allegedly the context and we didn't know anything. We were just cracking fire and jokes. Yeah. But what that article did that I don't think Brett Favre's lawyer or Brett Favre thought was going to happen is like it introduced us to a lot of 
a lot of people. And the amount of humans that are like notables that have like sent me a message be like, man, learned about you through the whole thing. Like, you're wide open, aren't you? And I'm like, uh, what, what do you mean? And I read the New York Post lawsuit thing. That tweet about the salvation, the- Sick, you banned it. They're like, brilliant. <laughs> uh, I'm like, thank you. Yeah, I thought so too, whenever they put it out there. I, Joe like pretty much had like learned about me through that entire process. I assume he and Brett are friends or at least know of each other because that mm -hmm. quarterback community. And he was so kind and so nice to me. And his wife, Jennifer, who he called on the sidelines, like such a positive, like those two were like the coolest people on the entire resort. He lived up to everything you would have hoped that Joe Montana would be. And him coming on the show, we're incredibly grateful for it. And next week, it's going to be bananas. We try to explain to people in the first hour how dumb Radio Row is, AJ, every single year that we're out there. Can't wait to get there, brother. Can't wait to see you all week. Yeah, the, uh, the PTZ cam that you get to operate to kind of just, uh, maybe if there's a little wall between guests or something, and you can peruse the crowd and zoom in on people, and then Damn. we usually, you know, guys start hollering, try to get them over there. It's a whole situation. Yeah, it's it's somewhat of controlled chaos for a couple of days. Now, so there's a lot of humans that we're going to be able to scan. <laughs> oh, I remember what that guy said about yep. me. Yep. Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. what did they? What did this guy say? Yeah, pull it up, Zito. We're not going to do that. We're going to be positive. What? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be positive. Come we're going to be positive. On. That's what we're going to be. Because that's who we are. That's dope. And that's what we stand for. Especially with that yep. shirt on. Yeah. AJ, he, he came in peacocking with this damn shirt on today. Okay? Stood for not. three minutes waiting for a compliment on the shirt in the think tank. And I will say it's very nice. Thank you. And I appreciate it and I'm excited about whatever you're going to wear next week. But let's enjoy that. Let's be positive. Absolutely. We don't need to tell every rat that they're a rat. Okay? No. And maybe remind me of that, too. Okay, like when Thursday and I'm out there. Sure, we'll try hey, to remember that. Please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, too, too maybe a few, maybe just a couple. Yeah. Not everybody, Positivity just a few. Positivity we'll can, be, can be two. grown from negativity if you if you think about it. You know, you, you can be negative to somebody, and from that experience, it can be positive. Yeah, but anytime you look back on it later, you go, nah, I shouldn't have wasted energy on that. I don't you know. should also keep in mind when you're talking about karma, putting stuff out in the universe, we are going to be in Vegas. We are going to be hitting the tables. If we're just very Bingo. negative the entire time, we're going to be losing a lot of money. We but, just talked to Chuck about this. Exactly. Literally, Chuck's beat leukemia. Chuck's had like four or five different situations through his life in which the future was very much questioned. Did you hear what he said? We got to be positive. You put positive out, positive happens. Let's remember that. Mm -hmm. Let's remind each other that every single day we go live out there. Let's do that. Yep. Yeah. When we walk in that building. And it's literally what? 45 to 50% enemies now at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Because everybody is. Isn't that crazy, AJ? This is a whole different year now. This is a whole different year. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's that high. I wouldn't say enemies. I'd say there's different. Yeah, people have different motives for whatever they may do and say. But I don't know if it's that high. We're going to kill them with kindness. We're going to kill them with kindness. Absolutely. You guys are. Yeah, especially if it's the gambling thing, fine. I will be the one that loses five thousand dollars in Vegas, and you guys can. I win. won't put one dollar okay? on Must the table. Nice. That's what it means. Just losing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I have to. Wow, this guy's living good. No, 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 oh, I, I, I already wow. withdrew. Wow. Only dumb no. about five k. I already, I already hey. withdrew wow. the money. No, 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 no. I already withdrew the money that I was spraying. Espresso martinis on you tonight. No, I'm living good. Congratulations. No. Wow. I know what you guys are doing. Unlimited Holy shirt. God, no. This no. guy's killing me. I already yeah. withdrew yeah. money, okay? And I'm just <laughs> adding on all the other withdrawals sure. I'll have to make because I'm only losing because I'm going to be mean to everybody. Mm. Jesus. Yeah, Give me okay. a break. Yeah. Well, seem like a good hey, don't lose, that, uh, don't lose that Lamborghini. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Connor, jeez. Oh, don't, no. don't put the full mansion on it. No, yeah. not, I mean, not the mortgage. No, -uh, not the village. Not me. Yeah, okay. Jeez, this guy's living good, Tosh. I, I love it. Guy, I love it. Sons of, I walk myself into it. So, I mean, it's only on yeah. me. I'm not pointing any fingers, but you sons I of bitches. I do appreciate you doing this. Speaking of doing this, uh, Colin Coward said, Caleb Williams doesn't want to go to Chicago. So, <laughs> I, I don't know what anybody's even talking about. Where did he hear that? I don't know. He's plugged in in L.A. right at USC, we all assume. So, anytime he speaks about anything USC, we have to listen because Colin Coward's been in the sports media world for a very long time. Very accomplished. Very good at what he does. I'll listen to a promo or two of his throughout the season. I go, Coward still got it. Yeah. Colin Coward's still throwing his absolute heat. But he is kind of tied in over there. So whenever he alludes to the number one overall pick, potentially not wanting to go to the place that has the number one overall pick, it's certainly going to make 
noise, and it did. Mm -hmm. So much so that Caleb Williams actually changed his profile photo to a photo of him wearing a T-shirt as a child with a bear on it. Like that. So now we got Ooh. an entire thing happening. And did I would assume Colin Cowherd did hear something from somebody who probably would know sure. that maybe they're thinking something. Caleb might be in a different uh, position. There's a lot of smoke right now. Combine season, draft season, it is bananas. But when we hear stuff like this, I think it only feeds the narratives that some people have about Caleb Williams, like, relax. But then on the other side, there's people that are like, Caleb Williams is one of the only talents in the last 20 years where if he did do the whole Eli, I'm not going there, it would end up working out because of how talented he is at football. It's just, it's great fodder for conversation. We assume it won't take place, but when it's mentioned, we have to talk about it, AJ. It's a massive ordeal there. Yeah, I want to know, though, I think there's a difference between not wanting to go somewhere and are you not willing to go there? Like, yeah, you can easily be like, hey, I don't know if the scheme fits my what I do. I don't know, you know, if they have whatever I'm looking for. But, yeah, if I get drafted, I'll go there. That's It's one thing to not want to go there, but if you're actually willing to pull the old Eli situation – and force your way somewhere else. That's a different story. Eli John Elway. Yep. Uh, it has happened a few different times. Mm -hmm. Not in the modern social media. Yeah. Everything yeah. is either the greatest move or the worst move of all time <laughs> era that we're currently in. But it's like, I think the way some people view him, and I'm not a, we are not draft experts. No. We are not scouting experts, although we do have a very high hit rate whenever we put eyes on somebody. Bingo. We say, That's a Sunday player right there. Very high hit rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very hot. We don't swing the bat a lot, but whenever we look at somebody, go, oh yeah, that's uh, going to be great in the NFL. So we don't, we don't really do the draft the same way everybody else does. We just hope and assume and break down the situation they're going into, which is a massive piece of it all. But what some people are saying about Caleb is like greatest draft prospect of all time would take him over Andrew Luck, would take him over Peyton Manning. That so all of this shit that has seemingly come out over the last few months about like. You know, the baggage of, like, his dad, I guess, is very loud. Mm -hmm. His dad does a lot. And uh, the thoughts of this and the thoughts of – it's like I, seemingly everybody's saying it's 100% worth it with how great of a football player he is. As one great person told me before when I was describing a situation, when you can spin it, you know, literally – you can do whatever Don't matter. in the yeah. football world. And that's basically how this whole story is going to be written for Caleb, if it works or not. Well, and for like all the rookie QBs. Like I think Daniel Jeremiah said this yesterday. He'd be stunned if the Bears and Patriots don't take a quarterback, but there's a chance the Commanders, he's not completely sold. But for all three of those guys at the top, like you got to have some good feeling about the fact that all the offensive coordinators on those teams are new. Like the Bears, that's a brand new OC. He's going to probably, he probably had to come in with a plan to sell, like, hey, this is what I want to do with what whatever rookie QB you guys like. Like, there has to be some sort of... Or they're trading. Or, or they're, yeah, or this they're trading Justin out, Fields. and this is what they're doing with Fields. But, like, at least having some sort of plan for players like that has to reiterate, not reiterate, but kind of help a little bit for them. You know what I appreciate, though, AJ, is who, whoever told Colin Coward this information, they were like, we'd like to help the Chicago Bears make their decision on whether or not they want to stay at one or if they want to trade. Colin, why don't you tell the world... Mm -hmm. He's not interested in going. It's that, like, you know, mm, I'm not going to say arrogance, but it is kind of that arrogance that, like, yeah. a lot of NFL people that I've chatted with are like, let's see, dude. You know, everybody's saying you're the next Patrick Mahomes doesn't mean you are. You know, there's been a lot of people that have been tagged the next a lot of things, and it hasn't worked out. From what we have seen and watched, I think he's going to have success. But, like, a lot of it is dependent upon him making plays and extending plays. And it's like D linemen in the NFL run four twos, four threes. It's a little bit different than in college. Not saying it's not going to work, but all of this shit that is coming outside of the Caleb Williams, which might be fake, you know. But all this, like, he's only going to these couple teams is what it was beforehand. He won't do this. It's like that's already a lot. It's already a lot for somebody that's Would never – Would you take him? Would you draft somebody if you knew they were public about not wanting to play there? Yeah, because I think, like, uh, little things lead to big things, right, which is kind of the conversation. Like, all these are kind of indicators, I think, that are not good for Caleb. And I'm not saying Caleb's a part of it, but I'm just saying some people could view it. Yeah. If this is how he's handling this situation, let alone whenever we got to redo an offense coordinator or we have to do this, how are they going to handle all this? And then it seems like all the, you know, like you hear Tom Brady talk the other day. He's like, the team, the team, the team, yeah. the team, the team, the team. Quiet, you don't really hear it. You know, C.J. Stroud coming out. 
just super. Every, well, he's dumb, obviously. That C two thing said that he's dumb, but everything else was just like whatever, whatever. It's you know, there's some indicators that would lead that maybe this doesn't happen whenever somebody's really good. Mm -hmm. But Joey Burrow, there was rumors for a Big little up. bit that he was yeah. potentially going to leave, and he's worked out pretty good. So it's like, would I draft Caleb if I'm number one and I need a quarterback? Yeah, I'm taking him. You know, just not you only bad. know from speaking with him when they like if you're going to take him number one, you're going to have plenty of times where you worked him out, you brought him in, you've talked to him, you've probably talked to his family, his coaches. Like you have a much better idea than we do just sitting here hearing what other people are saying. Exactly. And I would like to get the chance to learn more about him because all we ever hear about him is just like, well, his people are saying this. It's like, I'm tired of hearing from his people. I, I would like yeah. to hear from Caleb It's a hard Williams. thing, though. Everybody has people. Like, even in college now, a lot of guys have people because of how the whole NIL situation plays well, out. Caleb Williams' is camp, it's like, I want to hear from Caleb. Yeah. I, I'm about sick of hearing from the camp, you know, because we're not drafting the camp. We're right. drafting Caleb Williams. Yeah. But you are you also drafting the camp? You which are. Also, yeah, you, it, it all comes with it. Yeah, which is a whole other decision to make for a billion-dollar yeah. organization. When I first saw this, though, and given last year with the uh, C.J. Stroud stuff and when we kind of just be like, hey, is it possible that the Texans leaked all of that stuff because they knew all along, hey, we want him at number two. Like, is this potentially the Bears just kicking this up to see, hey, well, some other team, he, he's obviously regarded as the – the top quarterback no matter what you know it's not even close compared to the other two guys are they just putting this out there to kind of kick the tires on everyone else and be like hey let's see if we can get another team to kind of give us a king's ransom to move up to number one to take this guy uh, we do have to remember that we can't be so immature it's very possible we are everything is bullshit we are 10 yeah. days away from bullshit season which and we talked about Ugh. like oh my god jesus with Tony, every day we're gonna have to deal with, with burrow it. like Put a number on it burrow at, we, it it, like burrow at one point it was like yeah for sure he's not playing for the Bengals. he doesn't want to and it turns out that was all bullshit this could be all bullshit and i think it would be nice to come out and hear him talk but him putting up the picture of him wearing the bear on the that's that is his version of saying this is bullshit hey caleb Good luck, man. It's going to get so loud. Oh, yeah. Cuff tough of months, go to media day, right? It's going to be so loud. A lot of these guys, are, will they go to media day probably? I'm sure they're getting paid good money to, For to the, promote the some combine. stuff. You're talking about at the Radio Row? Yeah. We've got a list of some uh, people that are coming. There'll be college I, guys there, right? Some yep. guys that are draft eligible. There usually is. Yeah, I don't think Caleb, though. I don't think We Caleb. had Hooker last year. He was selling them beans. Hooker, Those Stroud. Were Stroud. 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 Hutch, two years ago. Yeah. Hutch, yeah. Hutch, yeah, yeah got you walked him down big time. Why you need the other one. be there. Huh? Big Penix. Who? Uh, Michael Penix. Yeah. Okay, hey, that'd Michael be Penix nice. Junior. He's at the Senior Bowl currently down in Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Yep. Saw him uh, throwing one on ones and also telling Kalen DeBoer get out of the photo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very weird. That did not happen. That was not real. No. Um, Patriots did a highlight montage of just Bo Nix and Michael Penix. Is that, is that not the weirdest thing? You've ever, and then put it out on their own social. I would assume that they're going to do others as well. But isn't it just to do the quarterbacks? Mm. I don't know because they know that you, Mark's. It, exactly, like quarter, of course, but like when with the he was the cover photo where, too of their first like mock draft too, wasn't it? Yeah, it's it, like the whole entire thing. Hey, why? Speaking of these types of things, I think these will continue. Yeah, when teams do this and make content. I think the Colts were doing something similar last year. Whenever we were in a quarterback market, yes. I think it's a social media team trying to draw up whatever, and maybe it's Kraft saying, "Hey, tell me who." The fans. Who are we looking at? Who are the fans most, yeah. you know, juiced about? Sure. The, the post that I'm worried about, why Dak Prescott post that Super Bowl poster? What was that? I saw that, and I'm still, like, I don't. I feel like I just don't, I'm not in on the joke, or I'm not in on whatever's happening. I, and maybe it was an ad, or maybe the NFL asked him to, but he's Dak Prescott. He's made a lot of money. He could certainly say, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. He's not very active on Twitter mm. or X at all, except for ads. So when this one drops in the old timeline, you know, I'm like, oh, Dak, tweet and welcome to X. You know, good to have you here. And then you go and look at the responses, and it's exactly what you think it is. Yeah, a game you're never going to be in. Yeah, yeah. And it, there was comments turned off. So that means quote tweets, which is even more exposure. Like, people are like, um, turn off the comments if you don't want to read anything. It's like quote tweets are even, that's even louder. Quote tweets is the goal of every single tweet mm -hmm. so that, you know, you can be seen by more people because then you see it in context. So he's just getting cooked into quotes pretty much. So you turn the, you turn the comments off because you don't want to hear, you know, it's going to probably produce some garbage comments, but it doesn't matter. It's almost 
more now, you say, when you do that. It's getting louder, yeah, because when you, yeah. somebody that might just comment, that's only going to show yeah. up in a timeline of people that follow you and the person you're commenting to. But whenever somebody has to quote tweet it, it's showing up in their timeline to everybody yeah. that follows them. So it's almost putting a bigger spotlight on the thing as opposed to what the turn in the comments off is supposed to do. So I don't, I don't know the exact, uh, like, mission of said thing, but maybe Dak just wants to watch the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pumped maybe Dak just well, he's pumped up about it. Uh, I think maybe Being we pumped. should keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. that Dak Prescott is pretty pumped up about yeah. watching Brock Purdy and watching Patrick Mahomes go do his thing, but he's also Dak Prescott. Whoever's running his social or him has to know that that's going to be the immediate reaction immediately afterwards. Has yeah, to know that. yeah, I mean, <laughs> I have no way. There's, there's no These people get these reason. social media degrees. Yeah. And then it feels like their sense of feel on social media is not one that has ever been found because they tried to learn what social media was. In Who a teaches the class? Who teaches the social media classes that people get degrees in? AI. Buddy. AI. I'm not even getting into it. I mean, do you think 19-year-olds teaching class? Tom from doing? MySpace. By the time, now, Good. Tom from MySpace should teach an entrepreneur thing and also photography. I think he's, uh, yep. I think he's a big-time photographer. By the time the book is done, that you wrote about social media, that phase of social media is already dead. Those yep. trends, are, by the time you're a chapter into that book, already dead. So if it's the history of social media, I think you can certainly teach that. But to be good at social media, and I think a lot of people are falling for this. It's not just athletes who are hiring social media teams. A lot of these legacy companies are hiring youngs, you know, because we know how important social media is. We hear about this for the alpha generation and the millennial generation and all this other stuff. We need to be in social media, but the olds have no idea what it is. They have no clue. So, boom, what do you have? Lo and behold, well, it's got a social media degree. Mm -hmm. This is the person that we should certainly hire. Then they're handed the keys to a Ferrari with a Ferrari kit. Mm -hmm. ah. Pac-Man's first song released under Universal Label is today, Ferrari kit. But they're getting handed the keys to these Ferraris, and they have no idea. what. They have no feel. They have no sense. They have no, like, actual idea of what this could happen to the brand. All they're looking at is numbers. Like, that particular tweet is going to do massive numbers. Ma that, that thing's going to be seen by a lot of people. In, a, in the social media degree's eyes, job well done. Did it. Job, look at what I did. You're welcome. Look at me. I got all these impressions. And it's like, are those the ones you want? Is that Are those yeah. the impressions you want? Is that what, you know, you're looking for? Is that what... I just thought it was very dumb. I thought it was a dumb move by Dak Weird. or whoever's in Dak's team that decided to do that. Even if he is pumped for the Super Bowl and loves the NFL like the rest of us, that was an alley-oop to people just to kill Dak Prescott. Yeah. And uh, I don't love it as a fan of Dak Prescott, AJ. Yeah, I'm a fan of Dak as well. I'm still confused. Maybe he'll explain it a little bit. But are there people out there you think that are good at running people's social media? Like someone that make maybe they make you think it's actually them doing it but you know they have a squad uh there's a i've met a couple of social media people i know one shadow, guy that ran a few counts that was really good yeah, yeah. Shadow line. yeah shadow line does good i think for tom i think that's a good group over there uh nikki tweets mm -hmm. he, he's a real Dog. chameleon he's a real chameleon he can get in yeah there. that's who I'm, i think that's who i'm thinking of i think gumpy though gumpy tweets out all the live videos like, he mm -hmm. could tag those in ways that we could get a lot bigger views and potentially just ruin people, which is what another account does with our videos, which is very nice of them to do that and try to kill us every single day. Mm -hmm. Axelrod, shout out to you, bud. See you next but, like, week. I think Gump does really well with it all. It's just, like, trying to figure out and sort through what matters whenever it comes to social media numbers and what doesn't. Like, hate watching, obviously, always going to be good. But is it good for your brand? Is it good for your company? I don't think so. But do you see the big number? It's like, whoa, look at how good that is. It's like, that's not real. Maybe if Dak makes a Super Bowl, they'll look back on this tweet and say, hey, look what all you haters mm. said back then. Freezing mm. cold takes. Yeah, situation. nice. Bingo. Yeah. It's long game. It's like Jalen having in the background of his phone him sure. walking off the field as the Chiefs were celebrating last year. Oh, so Dak posted that so that he could open his ex account and look at it. Bingo. And realize that the Cowboys aren't in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Motivation. Yeah. See, that's why these social media degrees are good. Yeah, I, I didn't even. Yeah. You're 100% right. I didn't even think later, about that. A year later, though, when he posts it, when he quote tweets that tweet oh, with the new poster of the Cowboys playing the Patriots in the Super Bowl, he's going to be the coolest guy in town. I called it. I already told you. Hey, Dak, we don't like what people are saying about you. Good no, luck out don't. there, though. Nice. Good luck, Dak.
You're paid a lot of money, obviously, so you can handle it. You're a quarterback for the Cowboys, obviously can handle it, but I hope you win. There's been some changes, obviously, around the NFL, down in the Carolina Panthers. A man named Dan Morgan, who I don't think all of us necessarily knew who he was, was hired as the general manager. And then you hear from people that coached him whenever he was at Miami and then have played alongside him in the NFL and they got a chance to watch him work whenever he was in front office personnel. And they're like, Dan is a monster. (laughs) Dan is a dog. Dan is the exact type of mindset you want to have in the position of power if you want to flip the culture. He had his opening press conference. Here's what he said about the type of players he's looking for, AJ. We we, we need to find those leaders, those competitors, as Jay Stu would say, those dogs. Like, we need some dogs. Like, we got to get some guys that are passionate about football and love football. They want to come out every day and compete on the practice field, in the weight room. We need competitors. We got to bring that back here. We got to bring that back here to Bank of America Stadium to where people get excited about coming to see our team. I don't think he's blinked since he's got the job. Nope. Those uh, I'm not sure scary. he's blinked since he got the job. But you see what obviously happened up in Detroit with a dog mentality trying to flip it. I like the Teppers going this route with Dan Morgan, AJ. Yeah, Dan Morgan, I would imagine um, he and Tepper probably will have a great relationship. We know like Dan Morgan, I know from watching him, I mean, one of my favorite players of all time. Like the guy was all over the place every single time he played. And you see, you could, I mean, you see his eyes there. I remember seeing his eyes when he's in his, his linebacker stance. He had a sweet visor on at times as well. So the guy is, yeah, why wouldn't you? This, it doesn't matter if you win the press conference or you win the hiring. I know we talk about that, but I think this is one of those things where it's going to be a good long term situation, hopefully, for him if they can win some games. There was another press conference that took place just yesterday of a new head coach in Los Angeles. There's a couple sound bites that certainly need to be heard before we end up talking to the man that said them. Here's Jim Harbaugh chit chatting about Justin Herbert and the team that he has around him with Derwin James and Keenan Allen. Justin Herbert, you, you, you know, you see, I mean, he's a. As well said on that video, I mean, that's a, that's a, he's a crown jewel uh, in, in the National Football League. Uh, Derwin James, there's another one. Uh, talk, talk about somebody getting me fired up. I mean, I mean, let's go. You know, Justin Herbert walks up on you, you know, like, okay, all right. This is <laughs> okay, awesome. all right. This is awesome. And obviously the buzz and electricity that surrounds this man seemingly everywhere he goes is a big deal. And it's not all glitz and glamour, though. He talked about L.A. and Southern California and wanting a winner. And then he started describing his team and how they're going to get there. And he said, work, just blue collar. We're going to work. That's a, There's no real magic to it. This is actually uh, a conversation about what he did in the weight room the first day he was in the building. The uh, weight room is, we're getting it cleaned up right now. We're getting it, uh, getting it all set. Had a great day uh, uh, just yesterday. I mean, talk about fulfillment. I mean, going, to, going in there to Home Depot and uh, you know, getting the shop back. And uh, I feel like I'm back at USD. I mean, let's get this thing right. Let's get it good. When these players come in here, then uh, everything's, everything's organized. And they're going to see that uh, yeah, things, are, things, are, things are changing. Things are different. And... Uh, we want to get into that center of player development, you know, that, uh, that weight room, and let's, let's have at it. You know, it's a, you hungry, you want to eat? I mean, it's, this, is a, this is an all-you-can-eat buffet right here. So let's get that work in. And, uh, that, and that's, that's what the players uh, have been saying back to me. You know, let's get it, coach. So. Uh, I love them. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now, the new head coach of Los Angeles Chargers, reigning national champion as a Michigan man and a Michigan Wolverines head coach last season, Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. Coach. Thank you, Pat. You're the man, dude. Hey, listen. You are the man. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Thank you for being the human you are and representing football the way that you do, Jim. Genuinely. I've got a chance to learn a lot about you over this last year, these last couple months, more specifically with the college football playoff, and then you getting back into the NFL. You are everything that is great with football, Jim. I just want you to know that before we start this conversation. Well, uh, appreciate those kind words, and... Uh, just humble, hungry, ready to attack. Yeah, and that seems to be the message for every press conference you have. Attack and dominate the day. And you gave a shout-out to your dad and your mom. Football is, you, I think you, you described it as like uh, you play, you coach, then you die. At what point did you realize that? Was that like whenever you were like eight, nine years old? Or when did you know this was going to be your life as a whole? Uh, six. Six years old. Uh, it was when I was uh, – 
in kindergarten, we were taking a bus to uh, to school, and I remember getting off the bus uh, one school day and pretending I was a, a football player, getting off the bus to to go into the stadium. And I, I think that's when it hit me. It's like this is this is definitely what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to play as long as I can, then I'm going to coach, you know, and then then eventually die. I remember having that 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 thought at six years old. Hey, there's a chance you're never going to die, by the way, with modern technology and your work ethic. Go ahead, AJ. <laughs> go ahead, AJ. Coach, what was that transition like from a player to a coach? I know I think you were working for your dad's staff at Western Kentucky while you were still playing, but was that a tough transition going from player to coach? Yeah, I, I think it took um, took about one year to get uh, up to speed. Uh Definitely the the playing football. I mean, there was an advantage. That's what I had been doing, you know, uh, up until that point, like twenty years, college plus plus as a pro player, five as a college, fifteen as a, a pro football player. But uh, yeah, to really be a coach, uh, you know, every day working uh, uh, at the Oakland Raiders, uh, Bill Callahan was the head coach, uh, Al Davis, the owner, um, two years. There, uh, you know, felt like four, um, you know, just because there was there was so much work to do. And I was really low on the on the totem pole, uh, quality control coach, uh, breaking down the tape, drawing the pictures, uh, you know, really learning mentors like Mark Tressman, uh, you know, Bill J. Norvell, uh, you know, all these all these all these great guys, uh, uh, you know, especially Mr. Davis. I mean, watching every 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 play, every tape, he would sometimes, I mean, I, I have, I have so many great stories of, uh, I, I was running the scout team at one point and, uh, you know, he called me and, uh, he was watching the tape and noticed that we had, you know, 12 in the huddle. Uh, I mean, wow. I mean, this is, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, just a level of, of detail, uh, when you're a coach that uh, I had to learn, had to learn the technology, but yeah, one year I would, I would say to any, any player, uh, you know they're gonna you're gonna you're gonna really lean on that uh, playing career because you know it you know how to do it um, you know you can put your body in those in those positions uh, and, and visualize it and then uh, be able to to explain and teach to a player probably takes about a year to get up to up to speed. Yeah, and that year uh, with the Raiders, I assume if it's anything like anybody else's quality control time, you're getting coffee, you're fixing the, uh, I don't even know if there's a printer, no offense, I don't know, fax machines back, yep. back then, uh, everything like that. That is a very low on the totem pole job. you got to earn your stripes in the coaching business. And you said in the press conference yesterday that when you went and took the USD job after, as a Chargers player, going and seeing it and telling them, if you ever need a head coach, when I'm done, I would love to be the head coach, you said in the press yeah. conference yesterday, there's a story with Al Davis whenever you told him you were going to go be the head coach of Al Davis. Did he call you crazy? Did he say, what are you doing? Was he pumped about you going and doing that and getting a chance to see you and quarterback from USD, uh, Josh, Josh Johnson? Johnson. Josh yeah. Johnson, Josh the, other, Johnson. the other day before the game was a beautiful thing, yeah. kind of a full circle moment for your career, I think, as we looked on. But was what was Al Davis's thoughts whenever you got the head job at USD and you left the Raiders? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Mr. Davis, I mean, probably a couple other stories before that, but, um, you know, you really had to think out how, how you were going to say something, what you were going to say. Um, you know, it, it needed to be thought out because the man is such a visionary and, and just, I mean, off the charts, so much so much more evolved than anybody I've ever met in football. Uh, but when I did go in to tell him, I said, you know, Mr. Davis, I, I, uh, I, I want to go be the head coach at University of San Diego. And he said to me, oh, I thought, you know, I thought we brought you here to be a head coach. I thought we brought you here to be an NFL coach. You know, why are you going there? So I had my answer thought out and I said, well, Mr. Davis, I've studied your career and I know you started as a college football coach and I wanted to emulate you and your career. And he said, yeah, but that was USC, not USD. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fan. <clears throat> Why do you think, now leading to that point, and now Davis being a guy that's able to do that, not a lot of people have been able to coach both college and NFL. Not a lot of people have been able to relate to the players. Why do you think you've been able to have success, and what are the differences, and how long do you think it's going to take for you to get back into the I'm coaching adults mode, or do you change it all for any of it? Well, it says a lot there, a lot, a lot of great uh, 
great things to think about. But uh, I mean, there's been a lot that have. I mean, Jimmy Johnson, uh, Pete Carroll, young, young in my career. Uh, I remember Dave Adolph, uh, who was also uh, a coach that coached both college and pro. Uh, and I put Dave Adolph on the level of, of Jack Harbaugh and and John Harbaugh, one of the greatest coaches of all time. That was uh, Dave. Um, you know, so many things I, so much I do in coaching is is because of Dave Adolph and and how he did it. Um, so I think there's there there are lots of lots of coaches who can who have done it and done it done it very well. I mean, bottom line is, um, you know, there are no great coaches. There are no good coaches that don't have good players. Uh, so that that's that's the main thing. Uh, you know, uh, you need to either in to get better. You gotta uh, you know the players have to be better. You have to either you know, draft them, sign them, or coach them to be better. Those are the those are the only the only two things. Difference in in college and and pro players um, really uh, not that much different. Other than the pro players, I mean, they're 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 uh, they're the best. I mean, they're the best college players. AJ, you know it. I mean, uh, if you get to the if you get to be become a pro player and make a pro make a pro team, you're the best of the best. Uh, you were the most coachable in college. You worked the hardest. You were the most disciplined. Uh, it meant the most to you. And um, so, uh, you know, it's like you're breathing the same air. Um, and not that the college players aren't that. They just, you know, you just, you just have to train them, uh, you know, to get there and not all make it. You know, don't all don't have the talent and the, and the effort, uh, you know, to make it to that. But, you know, these guys are pros. I mean, they're they're pros, pros, and uh, um, you know it's it's um, challenging because they've had good coaches in their past. You know, maybe they even had their favorite coach, might have been their high school coach or their college coach. So uh, you know, it's a level of um, you know what's, what goes through my mind right now is just you know you got to really bring it. I mean, I got to I got to be good. You know, I got to be accountable. I got to be uh, you know walking into a room, uh, you know, coaching uh, Justin Herbert. Boy, I better I better know my stuff. You know, I better have looked at all the tape. I better uh, uh, make this uh, this system clean. And every time he steps out of a, a quarterback meeting, then you know he's got clarity. It's clean, concise, and then uh, then he can go take it to the field. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a it's a big challenge. And right now, getting that getting that coaching staff you know put together, uh, you know, just want an all star staff, want experts at each position. Uh, you know, especially coaching the, especially coaching the quarterback. But you know, every 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 spot, you know, there is no weak link. You're only as, as strong as your weakest link. I think is uh, is uh, is a is a pretty good uh, uh, you know realistic, call it a cliche, but uh, you know truth, you know facts. So uh, you know, a lot, lot going on right now, Pat and um, and AJ and and I got to tell you this that that inter- that interview with uh, you did with Tom Brady. Uh, the other day. I mean, why are you watching about- that, Jim? Don't be watching that. Don't be, Jim, you got other stuff. Don't be watching our dumbass show, Jim. You, you're a good, you said, like, oh, there's a lot of people that are right, good right, in no, college. That was, that, that was, that was, that was not dumbass. That was, uh, you know, that was, that was as real as it gets. And you, um, you know, you, you said some of the things I said. I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's no magic, uh, you know, recipes or secret, secret sauce formulas. I mean, it's hard work, uh, good old fashioned hard work and good old fashioned teamwork. And, and Tom laid it out as as well as it can be laid out. You know, work, team, uh, teamwork. That's what makes the dream work. Accountability. Uh, I mean that that interview you did with Tom. I mean that should be that should be content that every every young football player, college football player, pro football player studies. Jim, I mean I'm mind blown right now that you even watched it and you said those very nice things, but. Like, thank you, obviously. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. But like, well, I, was, I was right there. I was right there with my 11 year old son, Jack. I watching this. I go, Jack, are you pay? Are you are you hearing this? Is Jack, this- don't listen to this show, <laughs> Jack. Jack, this is a, a, that interview. But don't listen to the rest of the show. And I want to go back to the beginning of your answer there. Well, ar- archive that one, please. Yes. Yeah. All right. Matt, we'll put a star on it. We'll send it over to you. We'll get the clip to the office. Uh, we've already seen that you've already done some upgrades at the Chargers facility. But what you said there at the beginning, you said there's a lot of guys that have been successful in college and in the NFL. You just went back like 60 years. There's like 10 people. You need to know that you're special, Jim. You are very. Special. 
special. And that answer you just gave is a beautiful thing because I think that's what everybody wants from their coach. You just have an ability to implement it and execute it at all levels. It's a beautiful thing. We're lucky you're here. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, John Harbaugh what's your favorite? another name. I got John Harbaugh started as a college coach, Miami of Ohio. Uh, uh, went to school there, Cincinnati, Moorhead State, oh, Indiana. He, he was very successful in both college and pro. Had a baby, John. The Harbaugh family can coach him up, no doubt. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, I know. So you, I know you play against your brother again this year. How do you, how do you guys game plan against each other? What is that like? Do you communicate during the week? Like, what, what are you gonna do? Like, do you already, do you already have a game plan going in? Uh, I mean, th- now, now you're talking about. I mean, they, they one of the toughest uh, competitors uh, in every way. I mean, there's a. Uh, you know the great guy John Harbaugh. I know, the, I and you know the competitor. I know the edge. I know the, you know, just the the sheer will. I mean, uh, and it, it just pulls it out of you. It pulls it out of you. You know, you got to be at the at your absolute best. You know, his his team's going to be, uh, you know, just tougher than heck to beat. And uh, so it's it's uh, yeah, that's it's it's it pulls it out of you. It's 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 one of those things that were uh, you know one of the great competitions and, and it. Practically every, I mean, every team, every team you play for, play against in the NFL is, is that way. Jim, let's talk about the teams that you've had in the NFL in the past. And I think a lot of people would say you were way ahead of time with the way you ran that San Francisco 49ers offense with everything that's happening out with RPOs. The college game is becoming the pro game, and it has been. But it feels like physicality has come all the way back in football. If we look at your Michigan team that just won a national championship, it was like, Hey, that was a hard nose. Remember, college was supposed to be wide open. Mm-hmm. We don't get to the quarterback. There's a lot of mis- uh, uh, some confusion, misdirection. We're airing it out. Your team was just physical. That is, it was a obviously a talented team in the waste room or out, you know, schemed and motioned and huddled and confused. It was yeah. a professional outfit. But it does feel like physical football is all the way back. Is one of the reasons why you took the Chargers job is because Herbert's able to play that particular style of football. And how much do you think your team is going to resemble what the Niners looked like back in the day when you were ahead of this curve when it came to NFL football? Oh, man, there's, there's, uh, that's so much great stuff there. I mean, it, it all goes back to the Vince Lombardi, right? I mean, football, blocking and tackling. Uh, and and there, was, uh, there was a time there in college football that um, – where yeah, it was it was getting you know, all this this wide open stuff and and and, and saw a real opportunity, some real low hanging fruit. Uh, what is if if they zig, we'll zag. You know, we'll, we'll be the the yin to their yang. I mean, we'll just come out and uh, you know get get a heck of a lot more physical. Um, and and things have you know you see it in in the, in the that's there's not that advantage currently in in pro football. I mean, every, everybody realizes you got to play defense. You got to you got to be able to run the ball. You better be able to play good up front uh, and protect the quarterback. You know, you better be all out on on special teams. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there's there's not some there's not too much low hanging fruit fruit right there. I mean, I see uh, see that's 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 the pro game. As for Justin Herbert, I, there's no style of football that uh, you know he doesn't he wouldn't he wouldn't excel at. I mean, in if you want to talk RPOs, if he was just going to be a running quarterback. He could he could he could be that you know a drop back pack pocket passer. I mean he, he he's got the potential to be the absolute best at that. Um, you know he could probably go play tight end and be uh, be a Pro Bowl tight end. He's, kicker uh, kicker he can kick coach he can kick. <laughs> we got a pretty good kicker here right now. But yes, there's no question. I mean he could be your punter. He could be your your uh, your your kicker. He would be a, a, a tremendous edge rusher. Uh, I mean it's uh, that size. <laughs> Yeah, the length. Uh, it, it um, yeah, but uh, yeah, quarterback. Uh, we know we 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 have a great one, and and I really was, you know, in that press conference yesterday. You know, really, also just sending a message. I you know some that ho- hopefully many heard it, um, which is, uh, you know, coaches, potential coaches here uh, for the Los Angeles Chargers. I mean, we have got to protect this. This man, uh, it, it, his environment, both on the field, you know, uh, off the field, in the meeting room, and it's gonna, it's gonna have to be. Uh, come here, I mean, you got to be, you got to be up for the challenge, you know, man enough to, you know, coach a talent like, like Justin Herbert and, and the rest of the team up front, you know, uh, 
offensive line, I mean, we're, we're relying on. It. I mean, every position group relies on on the offensive line. Uh, defensively, I mean, we got to be able to, you know, get teams stopped, uh, get, get turnovers, get get field position. Special teams, uh, you know, we're improving here. Uh, but uh, yeah, run game, play action. Uh, you know, we we've got to we've got to attack it all and and uh, you know get really good, get really good at football if we're going to accomplish the goals that that we want. Man, and our players want. Yeah, everybody seems to want over there. Justin Herbert listening to you talk, by the way, and he's super quiet, humble, obviously, and I think people say he has a phenomenal personality and great work ethic. There's nothing but hearing your head coach, though, come in and be like, hey, this is what we need to build. We're lucky to have it. That's huge for him. You know that, though, right, whenever you're saying it all. And is that always going to be a goal? Because Greenberg told us – Mike Greenberg told us a story that was like uh, you're at a funeral, rest in peace, Mm -hmm. to whoever passed away. All right. Great Ira Harris. Okay. This is the first time we've learned about this. Rest in peace to uh, Ira Ira Harris. Yes, sir. Moment of silence for Ira Harris. Great man. Moment has passed. Rest in peace. Okay. At that funeral, Mike Greenberg said that you guys started a conversation and he said, unprompted, you came out and we're just talking about Justin Herbert being like the next generation of what a football player is supposed to be like absolute love affair with Justin Herbert. Obviously you have a connection to Spanos family and to the chargers as you played there, but he was basically saying while you were still in college, not even thinking about the NFL at this standpoint, but looking ahead at the NFL, you're like Justin Herbert's guy, Justin Herbert's guy after meeting him, talking to him, seeing him, obviously you looked up at him at, has that grown? What what has it been about Justin Herbert, and how has it been with Justin Herbert since meeting him here, since taking the head coaching job? Yeah, I mean, uh, and yeah, going back to that uh, time, I remember the conversation well with Greeny, and uh, you know, we were a lot. We were talking about uh, JJ McCarthy and what I thought of JJ McCarthy. I, you know, just think he's 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 tremendous, and I was comparing him to uh, you know some of the people I thought like uh, um, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen. Um, uh, and you know some of the great quarterbacks uh, that are that are in the league, and um, and and de- definitely uh, you know we got off in on the Justin Herbert. And it, it, there's no secret here, right? I mean, everybody everybody knows uh, you know how great of a player he is, right? I mean, you just just have to just have to just have to watch. And Lamar, those 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 four were the ones I was comparing uh, JJ to to at the at the time. But uh, yeah, there's a there's a there's another another level there with um, with Justin Herbert that um, you know just gifted you know mom dad and God and uh, the way you see him you know like uh, some of the games he's played I mean it's just and tough and tough and you know um, you know people people hit Justin I you know you notice that and he just you know he just you know big hits and he's just down and then he's pops back up you know like you never see him complain about uh, you know a late hit or anything. It's like he just shrugs it off, like it's 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 not even a not even an issue uh, when he gets hit in the boundary or or, or late. And uh, you know maybe that's maybe he doesn't get some of the calls he should because he because he doesn't. Uh, but you know some some of the fourth down pickups he he's he's made. I mean the presser situations. Yeah, well that, that was the kind of conversation we were having. Uh, with uh, with Greeny that day. So whenever you two, are, it feels like you said the yin to the yang. When people yang, we're gonna yang. When zig, we're gonna zag. Feels like you and Herbert, I probably see football the same way if I had to guess. And uh, do you feel like it's a perfect fit? I feel like it is from outside looking in. Everything that Herbert potentially needs comes in the form of one coach who's a little bit more demanding, commanding, understands him potentially a little bit more. Do you feel like it's a perfect fit now that you've got to be around each other a little bit? Yeah, the I do. I mean, uh, the organization, the Spanos family, um, everybody I've met here in the in the organization uh, that wants to work, wants to win. I mean, our owner Dean Spanos is here every single day. He's like one of the first in the building and, and the last to leave. I think John Spanos is a star. I think we uh, uh, Ed McGuire, who's here when I was here, really knows nobody knows the cap better. Joe Ortiz, he just came on board the other mm-hmm. night, uh, and the players. Derwin James, I've mentioned some of you know some of these guys I'm having conversations with that are that are getting me fired up and inspired. And um, Keenan Allen, I mean, some of the guys that are best. Joey Joey Bosa, uh, you know, back and forth talking to him. Khalil Mack, uh, Austin Eckler, um, 
meeting some of the the offensive linemen. Zion jo- uh, Johnson just met him today. I mean, great looking guys walking through the door. Um, and and and, and Justin, um, you know, I think I think we do. I think we have a lot in common. I think we share uh, a very important asset um, of being relentless. <clears throat> Well, we have been relentless in an opportunity to potentially get a chance to chat with you on this program, and we are incredibly thankful you're back in the NFL and that you joined us today. Good luck with everything, and keep that shop vac going over there, Coach. Uh, appreciate it. Hey, you're the man. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, hey, Coach. As we wrap up here on this Feel Good Friday on ESPN, we can't thank you enough for allowing us to do this for a living. We'll be back on Overreaction Monday of Super Bowl week. Nailed it right out. Let's thank go. You. Um, He's awesome. He's on. I think he's still on, it sounds like. Hey, you're the man, Jim. You're the man, Jim. Uh, just everything about him is like him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. He feels like genuine. Him. Always, yeah. Jim. Very confident. He actually thinks. Don't you know, I like how he, it almost, you see him, you ask him a question, and he kind of pauses, and he actually thinks about the question. Like, oh, okay. And then yeah. he thinks about his answer. It's kind of cool to see. God, a lot there that's good. Uh, don't yeah. know which yeah. part I want to go with, <laughs> uh, but I'll do that. And he's like, I feel like you have to have an immense amount of confidence to be able to be yourself all the time. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like with everybody else we talked to, just like Joe Montana, just like Tom Brady, just like everybody else, the amount of preparation and work that goes into showcasing the confidence and everything is something you don't hear about. This dude allegedly is going to sleep in a fucking RV mm-hmm. near the facility. It. Yeah. Believe it. <laughs> Makes sense. That's what it takes. SS Harbaugh. I, I think he said he wants, to, he wants to take it to one of those – Parks like on the beach they have out there that you could go set your old RV up, plug in, enjoy a view. They said the Chargers told us that he got there like Tuesday, Wednesday morning. First stop was Home Depot, shop vac. We're in a weight room. That's hilarious. And they walked in and they saw him shop. Imagine walking in, seeing your brand new head coach, and just like your thought is Jim Harbaugh. You don't know him. Just won a national championship. You just have thoughts about Jim Harbaugh. You've seen him do his thing. You do that whole. You walk in. You think they're you're there early. You think you're there early. Normally, you're the first person in there. You open it. Harbaugh is shirtless in khakis with a shop vac mm-hmm. in the middle of the weight room. Cleats on. Cleats yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, saying. we're gonna be we're gonna be all right. <laughs> oh. oh man. I mean, that little tidbit in there too that he talked to Austin Eckler. I'm sh- I'm sure Chargers fans are probably pretty pumped up to hear that. Cleo Mack too, right? Because yeah. you're thinking about Cleo Mack. All, yep, all of them are. Yeah, Ken Ec- and Allen, I believe, yeah. is mm-hmm. conversation piece. Eckler, I think his contract's up. I thought. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, but. Everybody's saying Khalil Max will be gone because it's like oh, yeah. a twenty million dollar save or something yeah. like that, and they're they got some cap issues or whatever. But if you're Justin Herbert listening and Jim Harbaugh talk about you, he's like, man, if you come coach here, you got to be man enough to be able to coach a talent like Justin Herbert. If you're an offensive lineman, like you got to be tough enough to handle the job of protecting a crown jewel behind you. It's like Justin Herbert's probably like. Yeah, about believe. time. Yes, Harbaugh, start, Harbaugh knows the gig. Like it's just like if anyone gets close to a quarterback in practice in the NFL, like you get cut. Like no, do not ever. That's our meal ticket. Every coach, every player yeah. knows. It. Keep that guy healthy and let's protect him. I can't believe he watched that interview with Tom Brady. Yeah, it's all, shout out Jack awesome. Harbaugh. Yeah, young, young Jack Harbaugh. Hey, young Jack, you should not watch the show. Obviously, no. especially this particular hour. If you are, but you're 11 years old, so you're certainly watching on YouTube. You're not watching on ESPN Linear, right? Which is what most of the demo stuff will tell you. Uh-huh. But you should not be watching the show, Jack. Wait till you're 18. With that being said, thanks for introducing our show to your dad. Yeah, yeah. keep showing your dad clips, mm-hmm. though. Go to school. I think they're going to do good. Yeah. They're in the Big Bad Wolf's division. Yeah, exactly. It's so yeah. tough. It's so tough. he's tough. in jail. What's they that? Have, he's they in have jail. some players. Chiefs of Holics in jail, but the Big Bad Wolf that I'm referring to is... Uh, Patch Mahomes. Oh, okay, okay. That makes yeah. sense. But it's re- it's realer now, right? Because he- even in the past years, it's been like, hey, Chargers might go. But like now it feels like, hey, this is very, very real for the Chargers. Chargers always play Chiefs very well. Tough. The divisional games, no matter how good the dynasty is, is going to be difficult. Now, I guess you guys just beat the hell out of Jets, seemingly. Yeah, but every year we would go down to Miami and we'd lose. And Buffalo was always a problem. Like, Same division thing. games are always going to be tough, even in a dynasty, because they know you and there's a little heightened atmosphere and – you know, the, you're playing each other two times a year for these NFL guys, both coaches and players. If you get a couple little – if you're playing somebody four weeks from now and he talked about the NFL guys being the best of the best, that's like the smartest of the smart too. They're going to pick things up from the last game just in one year, let alone if you're playing three, four years mm-hmm. straight. There's going to be a lot of things that are known. And it's like with this new Chargers team, I think that's an advantage for the Chargers. 
And with if they keep a lot of these players that they're talking about, they know the Chiefs. Yeah. So it's an advantage for the Chargers again. Mm -hmm. I am a massive Chiefs fan. We all know that. Mm -hmm. But we have been on the Chargers bandwagon for a while. Mm -hmm. We've been very lucky that the Chargers people have been nice to us and kind to us. Obviously, I think it started because Tom Telesco was the general manager there. He's the one that drafted me pretty much into the NFL through Bill Polian. So we kind of built up a relationship. But Jim Harbaugh being your coach, they're going to be on TV every day. Yes. Yeah. Press conference is going to be there every day. It's in L.A. LA. too, so there's going to be media there. Every single the Chargers are about to be a massive piece of the NFL sports media, and we're all going to be better for it because he just drops gems, just drops gems out of his mouth accidentally in the middle of answering about something else, A.J. Yeah, I think they. I think it, it's obviously brought a bunch of, like, extra juice to everything. Like the hire, There's hirings all over the NFL. We know that. This one feels like Harbaugh is going to continue to make waves, going to continue – to pop up here and out throughout the offseason. And we obviously know once the season starts and he's behind a mic every day in training camp and then during the regular season, yeah, there's win or lose, it will be entertaining to watch. Mike Tomlin's in the middle of the field at the Senior Bowl. Always is. Jim Harbaugh's combine. Oh, oh man. Oh, yeah. He's going to be on that. He might be, he might be shirtless taking him through, like showing him how to do the drills. Throwing. Come on, mm -hmm. come on. This is your opportunity, man. This is <laughs> yeah. He's got his cleats on. He's making well look look at me getting out of this break with these cleats on. Let's get oh. to a break. I love that man. Uh on the other side we'll have Michael Lombardi. Ooh. Michael Lombardi obviously uh been there, done that with everything in the NFL. I'm excited to hear his take on Jim Harbaugh. He also knows Tom Brady well, mm -hmm. so I'm excited to hear his take on Tom Brady. But most importantly, the Bill Belichick stuff. Yep. Because here we are sitting in a time where the coaching cycle has ended. All the firings in which there were seven or eight? Eight. Uh, eight. Yeah. eight of them happened. All of the jobs have been filled. A lot of surprises. Obviously, Jim Harbaugh, Bell of the Ball. Mike Frabel, Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll still not hired. Wild. What? What does he think happened? Why does he think it happened? Because now there's articles being written about why people didn't want to hire Bill Belichick. Now, are those anonymous sources have brains? Or are they just projecting what other people have said? Or is it real? We'll hear what Lombardi says. Yeah. Yep. And we have to remember what narrative he's coming from, too. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Got to ride that wave, AJ, of who would want to hear that info? Okay. You know? I mean, AJ? Yes. I love Lombo is going to give us his opinion. We know that. And we got to remember where it's coming from, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Of course. Everybody, you know. How it, everybody has everybody has relationships. Everyone has experiences that will inform their opinions. What's the angle? Mm -hmm. Boom. You know, that is... Uh, What's the angle? This one is uh, somebody that's really tight with Bill. Mm -hmm. Knows Bill pretty well. Right. We know that going in. So we don't need to hear people bitching about, oh, this is Bill Belichick's mouthpiece. Yeah, he's a big fan. Right. He's a big fan he of Bill. But he yep. also knows damn near everyone in the NFL as well. Yeah. So let's get to a break. It should be good. Then Rappaport. Then we got Pac-Man wrapping up the Feel Good let's Friday. Go. Let's go, dude. And I don't know if you know this, Pac-Man's not the only one that dropped some new music. Today, Ferrari Kit, his first universal label single yep. has been released. I think he's got a party tonight, Magic City, Atlanta. Hell yeah. Release party right. tonight, Magic City, okay, Atlanta. Back. It's going to be, it's gonna be seen, going to be a movie. Marquette King, former punter in the NFL, has released uh, an album today called KS107. Nice. Mm -hmm. Kit Ooh. Squad 107, I believe is what that stands for. It's a uh, pop techno vibey yeah. album. Very vibey. Got some cutty okay. to it, it. It does have a little cutty to it. A little techno. I think he's created it all. Marquette. I'm happy for any ex NFLers that get into anything and have success. Good for the boys. Good for us, too. Yeah. Lombo on the other side. Be your friend, tell a friend something nice. It might change your life. Take five. 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 What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another week of Undercover no. Dogs. Our championship dogs, NFC and AFC. He's an undercover dog. He's an undercover dog for sure. My first undercover no. dog is Malcolm Rodriguez. He had five solo tackles, one assist, and an interception. He play on defense, Why? offense. Why? He can play any position that the Lions need him to play, even special teams. My second undercover no. dog is Jair Brown. He's a rookie. He had 10 tackles this week, five solo, five assists. Had his season high this week. He was named to the Pro Football Writers of America All-Rookie Team. My third undercover no. dog is Drew Tranquil, linebacker for the Chiefs. He had eight tackles. Ended up with nine total in all. This will be his first Super Bowl playing in. This guy sets the tone on defense. You can see how fast he playing. It's been a hell of a year with the undercover dog. Hey, people, help me. Hashtag undercover dog. We coming back after Super Bowl with our top five dogs of the year. He's 
an undercover dog. He's an undercover dog for sure. I had no idea what to expect whenever I came out here to Utah. Yeah, don't get the shock. I can't make it. Steve Smith Sr. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Pac-12 champion, head coach of the Utah Utes football team. Pulling in on a Harley Davidson Sportster, I do believe. Coach Kyle winning. Is pounding up that I ain't even wish for none left over for y'all. I'm locking the fridge door at the crib, cutting hits. I read through the catalog, came to conclusion, no one's touching this. Just finished the maiden voyage, hopping off the Mayflower. Said I'm trying to kill them off, whatever the take down. Seen the boats, I'm at home. I'm selfish with the goals. I <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I mean, you gotta do it. I mean, you gotta do it. I mean, I you. It is 34 degrees out here in the back to back Pac 12 champions. The mighty Utah student section has been here in abundance. They've been loud in today's a day where they showcase to the world that it's not just Mormons and soaking in Utah. No, no. <laughs> It's great football and an incredible fan base. They've been so kind, I appreciate the hell out of you all. <laughs> Have you ever thought something negative about a kicker before in your entire life? Yes. All right, relax, dude. <laughs> okay. Boston yeah. Connor was drinking with Dwayne Wade last night. $225,000. Let's remember this day forever, Cameron. That 29 out of the last 30 home games that happens right here at the University of Utah. The Utah Utes win. Cam Rising said yesterday, we don't lose at home. And today, they ain't losing. This place is going to be soaking in celebration this evening. You guys were absolutely Jalen Milrow often wears his own branded apparel reading LANK across the front. It's an acronym that stands for Let a Naysayer Know. Being told by his former offensive coordinator, that Bill O'Brien. That is not what I thought. Is that not what you thought? Boy, let a naysayer know. Let a naysayer know. <laughs> of course. The professional's right in the middle of his <laughs> lead. That's all right. I just keep I going. You almost lost me. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Real tight up here, as you were. I swear to God. you were too smooth with that. I thought it was going down. I thought it was going down out here. Whoa. I looked over his hands in. Oh, sorry about it. What did they say or no? What did they say or no? What did they say or no? That's what we thought the whole time. That's what we all thought. Hey, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at.
Why? Let's go! This show stinks, and the fact that you listen, we are very, very thankful for it. The all-time leading tackler for the Green Bay Packers. You pink! Damn it! Be your friend, tell a friend something nice. Could change their life. We want that! We want that! Sport! 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 Hello, beautiful people, and welcome back to our humble abode, the Thunderdome, on this Feel Good Friday, February 2nd, 2024. Hour 3 of the program starts now! Football! This is the greatest sport on earth. That man won at the college level and the professional level. That's A.J. Hawk. Hey, A.J. Hawk. Oh. Hey, great work this week, A.J. Hawk. Hey, great work, work by you guys. Can't wait till next week. Super Bowl's always fun. Great work this week is a tough one to kind of yeah, piece out. together because work and week Sometimes. will really get yep. you in. Great and this is obviously two very different words. But great work this week needs to be said not just to A.J. Hawk, but to the talk to the table at Boston Connor and at Ty Schmidt. Also, one half of the hammer, Don. Cowboys Tone Diggs. Joining us now, live, ladies and gentlemen, is a former general manager in the NFL, a consigliere around the NFL, mm. an author, a host, an email newsletter creator, Creator, an entrepreneur, a TED talker, a Lombardi line hosting, mm-hmm. GM pod, GM shuffle, pod hosting. What? Paisano, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Lombardi. Yeah, hey, what's up, guys? How we doing? How's everything? Happy Friday, everybody. Man, yeah, you, you were killing it today. The greatest of all time, Joe Montana. You had Brady, Montana. I mean, then the great captain come back himself on the show. I mean, this is remarkable. They, Who's ever doing your book and it's kicking ass? It's really good. Shout out to us. <laughs> yep. Shout out to us doing that. Shout out to Obviously, ZD Baby obviously, hammering obviously, the phones. Yeah. Shout obviously. out to Con Man having a connect up in Massachusetts. Whoa. Shout out to Travis Kelsey ah. who booked Patrick Mahomes on yeah. Yeah. the show. I, lo- I love it. I love Connor when he got to ask TB a question. That was great. I mean, I, his palms were sweating there. I mean, yeah. it was so weak. good. Yeah. Long he was head. loving I'm it. Yeah, like, I, want, I want to thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's what I always said to Brady. Tommy, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's always the right place for somebody that's bring you or brought you a lot of success and happiness and uh connor we all thought you did a great job yeah uh, well, yeah no. i applaud you my man it was no. great I, I appreciate it i've been like that before yeah you know here Con- comes the goat connor uh <laughs> Connor almost lost his cool in the middle of that question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's getting real pissed off, Lombo. You have no idea, brother. Yeah, Lombo, yeah I, I love it. Lombo, let's talk about um, Bill Belichick, obviously, the other, yeah. the other half of that pair. Now, there's been reports that have come out from a lot of different angles. We don't know where they're coming from or who they're coming from, but let me just kind of recap everything that I've kind of heard. Okay, Commander's not interested in Bill Belichick. That came out early. Then he was... Interviewing with the Atlanta Falcons, then the Atlanta Falcons had two interviews, then they moved on from him. Then it came out that Bill Belichick would require like 30 people to be fired, which is something that a lot of owners didn't want to do, uh, especially for a two to three year trial. Okay. Then we heard that maybe, you know, it wasn't just that 30 people would have to be fired. It was a... Uh, uh, kind of a conflict of philosophy that Bill Belichick wanted to run everything. Uh, Bill Belichick wouldn't change the way he did anything. And also people were fearing that he couldn't relate to this generation of football players, which is why he hadn't gotten a job. Now, all of this is coming out. We don't know who's saying it, how, why it's trying to get out, whatever the case. As we sit right here on this Feel Good Friday, February 2nd, with no head coaching jobs available anymore, a full coaching cycle going around, and Bill Belichick being available, why do you think he's not a head coach so Somewhere. And what do you think happens with Bill Belichick going forward, Paisano? Well, okay, full disclosure, I'm obviously close friends with the man. I, I won two Super Bowls with him. I started in 1991 with him. So I know him as well as I, I think anybody can know him. And so I'm speaking this from the truth. People might think I'm slanted, but it's not. Let's start off with the ultimate reason why. The NFL is now in a phase of collaboration. People want to collaborate. Everything is about collaboration. Let's bring everybody together. Let's have a nice talk. We'll go to Dairy Queen afterwards. Everybody will have a participation in all this, and we'll build a team. Let's collaborate. And I think what happens when you have guys like Vrabel and Belichick, who have strong opinions, who are very knowledgeable, probably more knowledgeable than any of the people interviewing them, then collaboration's door is not going to swing wide open. 
they're going to think he's just going to dictate to us. And I think a lot of times these coaches that have had success are viewed as being power hungry. Jim Bay in Atlanta, they favored a collaboration of their front office. Now, I honestly, he was told that Terry Fontenot was going to stay on the job, and he had no problem with that. Belichick has never had a problem with working with people. I, I didn't know Belichick when he came in 1991 in Cleveland. None of us did, and we all work together. And if you do your job really well and you could bring information that's a, that's worthwhile that he views as his way of coaching the team, because ultimately he has to coach the team. So I, I think there is a little bit of people don't want that. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want that competitive nature. It's hard for me to understand that you're standing there saying, we're going to win. We really ultimately care about winning, but we want to be in a collaborative way. The NFL, it's a hard league to be collaborative. The two teams in the Super Bowl, you could say they're collaborative, but Kyle runs the 49ers and Andy runs the, the Chiefs. And Brett Beach does a great job of helping them, no question. John Lynch does help him in terms of that. But there is a collaboration from within from the head coach. And I think Atlanta chose to go with their front office, which has won 21 games over the last three years, and basically said to everybody, the reason we lost is because Arthur Smith wasn't good enough. That's what they said. And let me just, before I close, Bill Walsh said this in 1975. It's in Paul Zimmerman's book, uh, The Thinking Man's Guide to Football, which nobody will find. It's impossible, but it's there. He said, anybody who sits with the owner and the personnel guy who's next to the owner on game day, they're going to convince the owner who don't know enough about football that everything's wrong with their team is the coach. And so they change the coach, bring new new coaches in, and the personnel people stay. Look who stayed in Atlanta for many, many years. There's been no changes there. So I think it's just part of the collaborative nature of the NFL today. It is interesting, and I appreciate owners wanting to be more hands-on and them wanting their team and their culture to be one that is a lot of ideas. The more ideas, the better. And I'm a firm believer and I think we all are in this particular program, it's especially whenever you talk about a quarterback, like when you're like, well, we got two quarterbacks that we believe in. It's like, well, then you got no quarterback. You need one. You need one person that is ultimately going to be making the decision. And I think what a lot of these places potentially feared, if you listen to it, is they didn't think Bill Belichick's decision-making would work in this era. Is that is that you think why? Or do they think it's too much bullshit to deal with a new change in who's making the decision? Like, ultimately, what do you think – adds into the whole thought because him not having a job 15 games away 15 games away or wins away from being the greatest of all time with eight jobs opening at one point it's like we're all pretty baffled do you think that's what it is do you think there's a real fear that he can't win because if you could win normally owners would do whatever wouldn't they well you would think so but that's not always the case i mean walsh told me in 1984 they're only competing against eight teams that are really trying to win that's when the league was 28 teams i'm not sure everybody's trying to win at that same level Look, if you spend, you can't tell me that if you spend two hours with them and study football or talk about football, whether you want to talk about philosophy offensively, philosophy defensively, philosophy in the kicking game, how to build a team, how do you want to work the draft, salary cap. If you don't, if you don't spend two hours talking about all those things, how do you know? I mean, Washington put out a release that they weren't interested in. They weren't interested in. And I have nothing against Dan Quinn, but Washington chose to go with their collaborative effort of, Adam Peters and Dan Quinn working together. And look, here, here's what I don't understand. It, it, this league, it's never been about the GM. And I've been one. It's not about the president. It's not about the GM. It's about the coach. And the coach has to lead the team. I work for Al Davis. And nobody in this realm, including anyone, knows more football than Al Davis did. And our biggest obstacle to win at the Raiders was every player thought they worked for Al. And they didn't think they worked for the coach. And that created a lot of dissension amongst the team. Well, I don't have to play that hard today. I don't have to do this today. And that became a problem. And so the NFL is not baseball. We are a sport that has to be led by the man who stands in front of you guys, 53 players, and they have to work for him. It does in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's a collaborative effort, but Tomlin, the buck stops with Tomlin. The same thing with Harbaugh. So I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions, this collaborative thing. You know, there's a great scene in The Sopranos where they're talking about making Tony, who's going to be the new boss at once Jackie April died. And they said, look, we need a supreme commander. We're not the Dave Clark Five. NFL ain't the Dave Clark Five. <laughs> 
AJ Hawk. It's not. Your question for Lombo. <laughs> Lombo, what about Ray? We don't even know we who all... the Dave Clark Five is, but we'll go. No, no hey, yeah. we do. Dave Clark. We ain't yeah. in that. The other four? He's not like the boss. Not as good as the boss, though, Lombo. No, right? Supreme Commander. No. Obviously. Speaking of, of Supreme Commander, the boss. Yeah, the, yeah no, he right. lost his mom. Yeah. He lost his mom, oh, unfortunately. Not, but we, yeah, Rest unfortunately. Rest in peace. Yeah. I mean, let's have a moment, moment of silence. Yeah, 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 there we go. Yes. Play the wish. Moments pass. Rest in peace to Supreme right. Commander's mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the way. All right, AJ, what do you got for me? Lombo, what about what about Braves? We all assume Mike Brabel would probably get a job as well. What what do you think was going on with him and what do you think the future looks like for him as far as coaching the NFL? I, I don't know how Mike Brabel doesn't have a job. I don't know how he lost his job. I, I'm having a hard time understanding that. Forget about how he didn't have a job. I, I think to me, Mike Brabel's as good a coach as anybody in the league. I mean, the fact that he played Kansas City in a game where it went to overtime. And his quarterback, and they didn't get a first down past the second quarter, and he got the game in overtime. That's that that tape should be ever forever watched. I mean, it's unbelievable. He gets his team ready. It's not his fault that they missed on a lot of first round draft picks. They were collaborative in Tennessee. John Robinson had all the say in the terms of the personnel. He hired Mike. They were collaborative there. They just missed on some players, right? They hit on some guys down the road, and they missed on some. And this was a tough year. They're trying to make Will Levis his young player. I don't understand it. I, I don't know how you could spend time around Mike Brabel and not think that this guy is a leader of men and is going to make our team better. You don't even interview him. I mean, you don't even bring him in for an interview. I mean, Washington didn't even – didn't even. I mean, people think they talked to Belichick. It was all back-channel stuff. I mean, there was oh. never any interest in there. There so was you, never any interest Hold on. In that? There, there no. was a story that they were interested, they did talk, and then people told us that's not true, and then now you're saying yeah. – uh, there, there was never any interest in that program there. I mean, I'm sure because Washington has so many different people involved in terms of the minority ownership, I'm sure people were like, saying, don't we want to talk to this guy? It only makes sense. It's only common sense we should, right? But they chose to go with their structure. So to me, it's the same thing with Vrabel. Like, I, I don't understand it. I mean, Carolina has – now, look, Dave Canales, I'm sure he's a great coach. He'll be great. But why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you just go? You, you just got the greatest gift of all time. Tennessee just gave you a gift. Walsh used to say this all the time. The NFL gives you every opportunity to get better. You just got to take advantage of it. Vrabel being available was wild. Mm-hmm. Still available right now. Oh yeah. What do you think he and Bill do? What do you think he and Bill do next season? Well, I don't know what Mike will do. I know what Bill will do. Bill will act as if he's still working. I mean, Bill will study the draft. He's already studied the draft. He already. That's what he does during the season. During the season, Bill takes the, the Thursday and the Friday of the week getting ready to play the game and works on college staff because he knows eventually that's going to come up. And then Saturday, he works on college and pro. So I'm sure he's got his Mac. You know, when you used to go to a staff meeting and he'd bring out the Mac notebook, you, you were in for a long meeting. You said, oh, we better buckle it up here. You know, it's like this is going to be a long one. And so I'm sure he's got that Mac and he's watching college tape and he's grading it because – he knows that some somebody's going to come to their senses next year and say, ah, I need a really good coach who's a proven winner, and he's going to be ready. That's just how he operates. He's not going to – he doesn't have any hobbies in the sense of, of, oh, I'm just going to go out and play 24 rounds of golf every day. He's going to go work on football. I would assume Brable would do the same thing. It, it, it actually ends up being a blessing for you because you get the chance to take a different perspective over what's going on in the league. Bill Belichick's on that boat. Like two days straight, Mm -hmm. three days straight. Get me off this boat. What are we even? You know, he tried to do something else. And then obviously all roads lead back to exactly what you have been doing for the last 50 years. How many seasons straight? He has been in the NFL the last time, or his first job, excuse me, was 1975 with the Baltimore Colts. Which is how many years? This would be the first year in 50 years that Bill Belichick isn't on his staff in the NFL. So, yeah, we we would assume that he's pretty uh, regimented yeah. <laughs> in the entire schedule. It's nice to hear that, though. I mean, like, look, when I was there, we would this the, this, the draft would end on Saturday. On Monday – he would say, okay, let's start working on next year's draft. And so then we would start working on next year's draft. Now, and great players off of tape, and we would start in a conference. Let's say we started in the Pac-12 when it existed. And then you would spend four weeks, three weeks going through. You write up all those players, and then you go to the Big Ten. You write up all those, and then you wait, and then you go on vacation. You work on, and then you get all the conferences done till the Southeast, and then you work on that. And then when you come back from your summer vacation, 
you, you've got four or 500 guys written up that you kind of know the draft as you get ready to go into the college season. That, that's what you have to do. I mean, that's that's kind of what we've always done. And so that work ethic is not going to change. Where's he doing that? His house with, like, Nike now? Or, or what do you think it looks like? Well, yeah, probably. I'm sure he's got some set up. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure he's got it set up just like we all do. We can all turn around here and watch tape. You know, the NFL's more than happy to sell their tape at nine ninety nine a month, whatever the hell it is. And so you can watch every game you want to watch, you know, you know, and so you don't even have the YouTube scout. You can watch all the games. And so it's just a way to get better. And I'm sure Vrabel will do the same thing, you know, because there's so many projects you want to work on. Like, I really want to study what this team does defensively, or I really want to study what this team does offensively. And when you're a head coach and you're in the middle of so many things, it's hard to do that. You know, but now you have some time. Bill Belichick at the age of 72 is going to be fresher and all the way back and 15 wins away from being the all-time winningest coach in the history of the NFL. Going to have to wait a year, I guess, which yeah. nobody could have expected. Ty, has a question for you, Lombo. Yeah, Lombo, going back to Washington, how do you think they landed on Dan Quinn? I understand the collaborative effort and all that kind of stuff, but they had the first interview with him, and then they let him out of the building, and then all the reports came out about, hey, it's a done deal. Ben Johnson is going to be their next head coach, and then whether it was true or not, Schefter reported, you know, they may have been spooked by the fact of uh, his asking price, but it doesn't necessarily seem like Dan Quinn was their number one uh, target, and he kind of just he just ended up being the guy they selected. How do you think they end, uh, they wound up hiring him, and is this going to be successful, or is this going to be the type of thing where in two years Washington's going to be looking for another head coach, and we're going to be doing the same thing all over again? Well, I, I think this was. I think Schefter reported yesterday that they that they received. This is according to them. They received more positive texts about Dan Quinn than any other candidate from other people. The wisdom of the crowd, you know, other people. But that doesn't, you know, that's to me kind of meaningless because, you know, what are you looking for in a coach? It isn't what they think of. It. What do we want? Who do we want to become? And I think what they wanted to become fits what Dan Dan Quinn is. They wanted to be collaborative. They want everybody in the building to be friendly. Look, let's be clear here. Eric Bieniemy probably would have been the head coach of the Washington team during the season when they were collapsing, except that Bieniemy was too rough on the players. Remember this summer? Oh, he, you know, yeah. Ron Rivera said he was too hard. We got to calm things down. Well, they weren't going to make him the head coach after he ruffled too many feathers. He coached hard. If you know Bieniemy, Bieniemy coaches hard. He's demanding. He has that word about accountability, which. A lot of teams don't. Brady talked about it on your show. Accountability. Who wants it? Who wants to have it? And people want it, but they want to do it in a softer way. They want to do it in a more gentler way. And I think that ultimately that's what led them to quit is they want accountability, but they want to be nice about it. And Dan is a wonderful person. He is from the Pete Carroll School of Positivity, right, which is great. He was successful with it in Seattle, and he was there. But I think at times – you have to be a little bit more, okay, here's what we're going to do. you got to be that supreme commander. And, again, if you all want to go to Dairy Queen after the game, that's great. It's fine. But you're paid to win, right? You're paid to win a Super Bowl. You're going to ruffle some feathers. And the players have to feel that way. Why did Vic Fangio leave Miami? We heard the reports out of Miami. Well, Vic ruffled too many feathers. Accountability. It's never going out of style. Just I'm going to tell you that right now. You want to win a Super Bowl? You want to win a championship? accountability is the, the cornerstone of your team. But how you get there, now that's how people want to have a debate with you. Hey, like Jordan said, yeah, you can call me an asshole or whatever, but you ain't never win nothing. Mm -hmm. right? you know what he, yeah. Isn't that basically what yeah. he said in the last dance mm -hmm. or whatever? Because of people talking about how demanding and commanding he was mm -hmm. of his teammates and everything. And Now, there's other stories, obviously, sure. off the court and out of practice where some people might say that as well. But I think a lot of people say, like, this guy was an asshole. Uh, as a teammate or whatever, and those people that are saying that are normally not the success, you know what I mean? No. Not the same thing with, I assume, the way Bill and Tom operated, Peyton, the way Peyton operated. I guess if you wanted to view some things when he starts a practice over and he's not the coach and he redoes something, you could be like, this guy's an asshole. Or you could say, damn, this guy really wants this to be done perfectly mm -hmm. before we move along. It's just levels to this shit, Lombo. It, it, and nobody thinks about it, Andy Reid being this way because Andy Reid has a beautiful mustache. Mm -hmm. Beautiful he's mustache. Love Loves hamburgers, cheeseburgers. Yep, he's jovial. And he's jovial and he's upbeat and everybody likes him. But, I mean, in practice, uniforms, everything, we are... 
It's like there's no wonder why success has followed them everywhere. You just got to be able and willing to execute it. And I think a lot of people are scared to death to do that. Speaking of, Tone Diggs has a question for you. Yeah, Lumbo, you just you kind of laid out everything that a head coach, and it's not even close. You, what you laid out is even close to everything that a head, head coach has to deal with uh, when you were talking about Belichick there. And then now there's two head coaches who are now going to be OCs in, in Cliff and Artie, who just got recently hired. How do you like? How do you feel about them going, getting everything taken off their plate as far as head coach is concerned, and just going back to OCs and how they will fare in their respective cities? Well, I think Arthur Smith is perfect for Pittsburgh because Arthur Smith can run the football. He can design runs as well as anybody, and his whole game is play action pass runs. You know, Atlanta's personnel last year wasn't – they had no explosive players on their team. They couldn't make explosive plays, and they really didn't have an identity because they were trying to get the ball to pitch, trying to get the ball to London. Oh, we got Bijan, but we got Algier. I mean, Algier two years ago averaged, I think, 5-1 a carry, you know, and then they drafted a running back over him to, to replace him when they really – that was – I mean, Robinson's a great player, but I think – I think he'll do a really good job. He's going to have better skill in Pittsburgh than he had in Atlanta, even though Atlanta was drafting receivers and skill players in the first round three years in a row. So he'll run the ball. He'll make the offensive line tougher. There'll be some more physicality. Tomlin's personality is going to be involved. But it's a better job than being a head coach because you don't have to worry about all the other stuff. You can be – and if your head coach has your back and he's going to set the tone – like Campbell does for Ben Johnson, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're, that's that's the perfect combination. You got a coach who's going to be demanding, and then you can play off of it. And I think that'll work. Cliff, it's going to be, you know, it's going to come down to they need to get a quarterback, obviously, in Las Vegas. I don't think that's going to be the one. I, I want to go back to Andy for a second. I think what people don't appreciate about Andy, A, he's really a tough guy. That's one. Two, Andy is is able to change his team. So after that Christmas Day fiasco where, you know, they gave up the they gave up the two touchdowns on the interception and the fumble and they got embarrassed. I mean, the Raiders had one completion after the first quarter and they went home and they had to sit there and, and, and really try to celebrate Christmas after that horrible loss. Reed changed. Reed went back in the office and credit Mahomes and credit Reed because they changed who they are offensively. They said, you know what? We can't win this way. We can't win holding the football. We can't win trying to make explosive plays. So they went back in the last four games when you count the three playoffs and you count that game. You know, Pacheco's run count has gone from 14 carries a game up to 21. Now, nobody wants to call runs. Andy Reid hates runs. But what he hates more than calling runs is losing is losing and so he's changed his whole team in terms of we're going to avoid losing we're going to play to our strengths which is kelsey pacheco and mahomes and we're going to work some rice in here and we're going to let our defense which has only given up 14 points over the last four games win games for us we're not going to make mistakes we've only had three penalties in that game and we're going to let the other team lose and they've been good and that takes a great coach to do that that takes somebody with experience who can understand how to solve the problem in the season, right? That's the hard thing to do is how do we solve the problem in the season? And he got Mahomes, who is the ultimate buy-in player. You got to give that. That's what makes great teams. Well, a lack of an ego, too. Mm-hmm. Instead of just continuing to bang the same drum and being like, this is what we got to do, to be like, wow, well, this ain't the team we are this year. Let's completely change it. And to your point about Patrick Mahomes, buy-in, it's like he even chatted after the last game, I think, about about halfway through the year, he had to start realizing what it was like to play with an incredible defense. Like, as long as I don't turn the ball over and we play smart here, like, we're going to win this game because of how stacked we are on the defense side of the ball and how the run game is like that doesn't get talked about as a good trait for a quarterback to have like Tom Brady had for all those years in New England it's like Patrick Mahomes is the next one it's fantastic and he's pairing with Andy Reid seemingly perfect this is the best team they've had I think what do you think about the defensive side and all of it well it is and here's what they're doing they're playing complimentary football I mean that's ultimately what the game is all about that's what you know, we can talk all this collaboration we want. We can talk about everything that comes into it. you got to have a, somebody who can bring all three things together, and it's the game. And you've got to have players that will buy in and be demanding. I mean, look, you know, uh, Kyle Shanahan's demanding too. You know, Hargrave made the comment about his practices in San Francisco compared to Philly. You know, you've got to be able to do that. You're not – practice execution – will become game reality. And what's improved more than anything on the Kansas City Chiefs? Their offensive line. We don't even talk about Taylor lining up in the backfield anymore. 
You know, they're coming off the ball. They're blocking people. They're, Mahomes has been sacked two times. Now he's made plays with his feet. But they changed their identity after these last four games. And Reed deserves a ton of credit. Mahomes, the whole team. The Chiefs are still the Chiefs, AJ. The Chiefs are still the Chiefs. Yeah, they are. Lombo, how much collaboration is good, though? I assume at some point you got to take the input and you, you want to hear from other people. But, like, how do you know when you cross the line and you're listening to too many people? Oh, I, th- I think it's a big problem, you know, and especially if you listen to people that aren't qualified to tell you. I think a lot of it comes down to the, the information. When I when I when I was working for Walsh, I thought to myself, "This man is incapable of making a bad decision. The only thing that could be bad is if I give him bad information." And that, to me, is what the challenge is for everybody in the organization. If you if you have the mindset that the decision maker will make great decision if you give them the right information then you're going places. I think Kyle Shanahan's the same way. I think Andy Reid, you know, you know, Brett Veach went to him and said, hey, here's Mahomes. I saw this kid. I love this kid as a sophomore. And he listened. But the person giving you the information has to come with enough experience, enough, enough knowledge, and enough information to back it up. It just can't be fly by night. Oh, I like that guy. Or it just can't be random. And so I think you need collaboration. But at some point, you can't get overloaded with information. You got to be able to say, okay, here's who we are. Steve Jobs used to walk around every office at Apple and walk in there and say, do you know who we are? Do you know what we do? And made people understand what they did. That's part of football. And when you have people that don't understand that, they get differently aligned. And you know, every oh, we all want to win. Yeah, we all want to win. But do you know how we're going to win? How are we going to win? That's the key. In every business, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, and if you have a good decision maker, feed the beast. Mm-hmm. You know, feed the beast because there's not a lot of those out there. We appreciate you joining us every single week. Will we, will we see you out in Vegas? I will be right there. I will be out there. Absolutely. We can't wait to chat with you in person. It'll be, Thanks, guys. Hey, you look thinner this year. Yeah, right? looking you look good. good. Yeah, I'm trying. You know, I'm trying. I try to stay away from it. You know, it's let's get older. I got a five. I got a two year old granddaughter. I got to stay alive to see her get married. I'm not going anywhere. I got to get oh, yeah. in shape. We love that, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Lombardi. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Lombo. I appreciate Lombo every time he comes mm-hmm. on. Now Walsh, Al Davis story. You know, he's been around the NFL forever and ever. Him talking about the Belichick situation is hilarious. Well, everybody wants to be collaborative. They've won 21 games in three years. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe, maybe not be collaborative with that particular group of people. And he said from the jump, I'm one of the closest friends of this guy. Yeah. So take that as you may. But it is fascinating, I'm sure, from him watching as a guy who studies leadership. And mm-hmm. like, that's his big business almost. It's like how you go about running things. Watching these situations kind of unfold with Belichick just being like, this is not... This is dumb. This is the NFL. This is not how this is supposed to go. And obviously, he's emotionally invested as well. Well, and then hear him talking about how, like, you know, the commander's got a bunch of texts about how great Dan Quinn is. And I think he used the term mob advice, which is comedy. But, like, is that really a thing? Like, isn't that the situations we talk about where there's too many people kind of voicing their opinion? If you're receiving texts and that is, like, altering your Mm -hmm. opinion on someone unless they're from you know people like jerry jones and like very very high up people have been in the nfl forever but i i it's surprising to hear that text were the reason that that got dan quinn over the hump in washington potentially from lamarty's mind and the way he's been talking about tepper is tepper's listening too many people that's what he says tepper's listening he's been saying that for a while he's been saying that for a long time you see what tepper said today though he said i'm in the background yeah He's, he gets, oh. This was at the Dan Morgan Canales uh, press conference. I think it was yesterday. Tepper was there, and they had a camera on, and they're like, we'd like to ask you some questions. He's like, no, nope, this is not my day. I'm in the background right now. It's like, did Dan Morgan stare through Use those crazy soul. eyes. Those eyes are the scariest eyes I've ever seen. Gaze, yep. gaze, right? Yeah, well, those, gaze are, was, those were crazy. Those, awesome. were, those are crazy, goofy eyes. Yes. Great, googly, mm-hmm. even. Those googly. are different. Those are locked in. I'm going to fucking rip your face off yes. if you say something that is wrong about football. Joining us now is a man who has a very similar look and yeah. similar outlook on football. Joining us, senior NFL insider for the NFL Network. Ladies and gentlemen, host of the weekly wrap-up with Rap Sheet and Friends, us being the friends, he being Rap Sheet, known meat smoker, Ian Rappaport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Hey, uh, we just talked to Lombardi about Belichick not getting hired anywhere, and we laid out the potential reasons on why some teams might not have hired him, whether they think, yeah, the light is just obnoxious. Gross. Ian, 
This basement that, sucks. That, sorry. Hold on. This isn't the Fixing first time. We, we thought you were going to be at Senior Bowl, too. Instead, we get same old, same old at a house in New York. That's yeah. fun. Yeah, you know. Sweet shirt. Hold on. I got you. I got you. Well, you can't move towards the light and think it's not going to be there. You know, that's... Uh, is this better? I like to have it up to make it's more, like, flattering, but this is... Your camera's kind of gross. You got to wipe it off with your T-shirt. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, I think it's a little. There's a little. Something. Hang on. So oh, he has one of those. I got one of these things. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Terry cloth. Very nice. Do you cover that? Do you cover it? Do you cover the camera hole? Oh yeah. I mean, oh, look how good I look now. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah, the shot is good. Yeah, yeah. The, good, the shot looks good. No, I. Yeah. I mean, hang on. Greasy mitts made the camera gross. Yeah. Now it's. it's hair looks uh, good. Hair does look phenomenal. I yeah. got a haircut actually. We're going into a big stretch now. We got Super Bowl, we got Combine, Bud. and then we got free agency. A lot of airtime. This needs to be tight. That a baby. Okay. That's why. That's why you're rap sheet. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, we talked about the Bill Belichick situation there with one of Bill Belichick's friends, Michael Lombardi, and he's basically just saying an ineptitude of leadership in different places. <laughs> they want they want to do collaborations, and then the people that want to collab though are people that haven't had success. So like it's going to be hard for Bill and Frames to potentially tell them, yeah, let's collab, even though we have it figured out a lot better. We think in our minds than you. Then there was also the thought that they would have to fire people because Bill Belichick would come in. Then there was a narrative like Bill can't relate to this generation of football players. From the conversations you've had, why do you think Bill Belichick was left jobless? And what do you think okay. the future holds for him and Vrabel as well in the conversation? All right. Let me uh, let me kind of get to the uh, the future part first, right? Because you have Bill Belichick who is, uh, who's going to be out, right? You have Mike Vrabel who's going to be out. And you're going to have some teams that are going to go into the season uh, with, you know, I wouldn't say lame duck status, but certainly coaches where they're in a precarious position. Nick Sirianni. Um, and Mike McCarthy, right? Cowboys, Eagles. So you're going to have Belichick there. You're going to have Rabel there. Two of the more accomplished coaches that are ever going to be out, right? So you have that situation. And I think the whole prism of how you view the Eagles and Cowboys is going to be based on knowing those guys are waiting. I think had the Eagles moved on from Sirianni, which I didn't think they were going to do, but it was certainly a big discussion point. Had the Cowboys done so for McCarthy, the speculation would have centered around Belichick. I think that would continue. Right, I certainly think that's something that will continue. Um, as far as why they didn't get jobs, or let's focus on Belichick, why he didn't get jobs. I don't know that people would have had to be fired, but let's say he was the Falcons head coach. He has thrived in a system in New England that is built around him being the center, right? him having final say, him arranging the personnel department kind of as he sees fit, right? And... If he went to Atlanta, he would want to do it the same way because that's the way he's had success. So, yeah, I would say if he had gone to Atlanta, you'd wonder what would that mean for Terry Fonda, who has done a nice job in Atlanta. You'd wonder what would that mean for Rich McKay, who's now kind of CEO of everything else, kind of stepped away from, from football. There would have had to be some changes. So it would have taken a lot to hire Bill Belichick. I would probably say he is the greatest coach of all time, so somebody should have hired him. Um, I have a hard time understanding how this all happened. Even if I take a look at each individual hire and I say, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense, I'm still curious. Okay, so we'll put it on the ticker. Rap board says he's probably the greatest coach of all mm -hmm. time. Nice. Probably the greatest coach of all time. That's a big deal. That is a big deal because Ian Rapport said it. So we'll make sure that people know. Can I, ed can I edit to definitely, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Too late. Maybe we'll do like late? dot, 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 yeah. dot, dot, dot. He would later say. Definitely. Definitely. Well, we have to put the edit sign like in, in X when you edit a tweet. You got to put the edit that it has. Oh, I hate that. But it's good though because then you can go see what somebody messed up because it shows the other draft right under it, which I appreciate. Have you, how many times have you got community noted? Have I got what? Community noted. You know what it is. How many times have you been so wrong that the platform actually says, got to correct this doofus mm -hmm. right here? Is that what that's called? Community noted. Um, I would say the only time I've ever been stupidly wrong is when I'll say, like, this team is hiring this coach or something like that, and then I just screw up and it's, like, the wrong team. And then I'll go in so fast because it's so embarrassing, and then they won't even have a chance to community note it. Okay, got it. Um, 
you know, they will have to just, I will be the one noting it. Okay, you'll be the one editing it within the 30 minutes because you're already on top of it. Within and, the 30 you, seconds. And oh, then, as fast as humanly possible. I and, can't do it fast enough. Then you go on your Instagram story and you'll be like, what's the coolest filter? Mm -hmm. Hey, I just tweeted this, dude. It's, you're really hip. You're a really, yep. you're really hip inside. I would agree with that. I, I appreciate yep. that. Go ahead, AJ. Ian, I don't know if this has ever been done, but is there, you mentioned like some possible lame duck coaches. Is there any chance you think an owner might just, you know, get a burr up his butt, as people might say back in the day, mm -hmm. and they decided, I don't know what that means, actually, but I used what? to hear adults say Burns, that when you really like wanted, the back when you really wanted something, when you really wanted something, like, hey, I really want to get this thing or whatever, and they just never, they're relentless to go get that. What if one of these teams fires a coach midseason? Would they bring in, like, a Belichick or Vrabel midseason instead of hiring from within an interim guy? Like, has that ever happened? Jeff Saturday. So, uh, well. yeah, <laughs> the Jeff Saturday coaching tenure, which I certainly enjoyed and appreciated, uh, no, Watch I your Jeff tone. Watch no, your tone. no, I love Jeff Watch, Saturday. Yeah. I actually got to know him a little bit last year during the coaching years. I do not think he was a good head coach, but I do think he is an awesome guy. And if he was someone who would be interested in having a beer, at Jeez. some point I would like, like to have a beer with him because that seems like that would be fun. Um, in order, AJ, to do that, they'd have to go through the process, right? So they'd have to interview two minorities who are not in the building. Um, they would have to kind of go through a coaching search during the season I don't believe there's any so precedent, no, it's but happen. it's well. I mean, it's the greatest coach of all time, as I said before. No, you said I probably mean, I, first, edit. and then you went definitely. I, yeah. Edit, edit button, edit button. Yeah, edit. you edit. caught it. You caught um, it within forty-five so, seconds. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. So theoretically, they could do it, but that is going to be really interesting next year. Like Belichick is. He's older this year. He's going to be a year older next year. Really? But I would still say, based on that part, I know. But based on the product he put on the field this year, and I don't mean the wins and losses. They were bad. But the players well, looked like they played so hard. And they looked like they played well, especially second half of the year. They didn't have a lot of talent, but he looked like he got them playing pretty well. I would think he's got a lot to give, right? And so you talk about, like, relating to players. Yes, he's older, but what Bill Belichick does, to me, still works incredibly well. And I think he's going to be out this year. And I think somebody will hire him next year. I'm excited to see it. The fact he's going to be a year older next year is crazy, though. Yeah, doesn't help him. That is crazy. Well, oh, it doesn't the help. The whole him. year. He'll be a whole year anything. old. It's crazy. Like mm -hmm. six months from now, he'll be six months older. Mm -hmm. That's bad. That's yeah. insane. That, you know? Tough for business. What, what, what can he do? Well, he's 72 years old then because I think his birthday's what? April? April they said? 16th. April 16th is his birthday. So he's still studying as if he's a head coach and a GM right now, allegedly, if you listen to what Lombardi's saying. So that's going to keep him young. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll do well, some TV. We'll learn a little bit more about him and everything like that. So here, here's kind of the other thing that I, I wonder, and I, I have not talked to Bill Belichick in a while, like since this all happened, but here's what I kind of wonder. Oh. So, like, when coaches are out, Right, like nobody wants to leave. So every coach who's out, and there's going to be some, uh, like we talked about, some really well-known ones. They all want to hang on, right? As much as they want to get back at the game, and a lot of them are nervous. What's going to happen to me if I step away? But what ends up happening a lot of times is they kind of reintroduce themselves to their families. They <laughs> kind of hang out. They decide they really, really like it, and they say, you know what? Maybe I'm kind of good. Like, Adam Gase has not reappeared in the NFL since he got fired from the Jets. And I know he gets calls. And I don't know if he'll ever be a coach again. And based on the amount of money he made, oh. see, that's just mean. Because right now, you he's probably it. on a golf course. What do you mean? It's, it's a probably picture got of the guy. single-digit <laughs> handicap right now. Much better than me. Crushing it on a golf course. Loving his family. And he should never come back. And I wonder, for Bill Belichick, when he's out, does he still maintain all of this? That is what I want. Yeah, Mike McCarthy, remember, he had the whole coach's office mm -hmm. down in the basement. And obviously we had that Gase photo ready because Dan Morgan, the way he looked the other day at his press conference, wow. was pretty intense. You know, pretty, awesome. intense. pretty intense. So Dan Morgan, Canales, obviously all the head coaching gigs. Cliff Kingsbury, offense coordinator now for the Raiders. I believe there's a defense I like that hire. Yeah, I think we all pretty much like mm. it. Who's going to be the quarterback? Who knows? But we'll see. We assume it's going to work. Antonio Pierce, Cliff Kingsbury sounds like a cool crew mm -hmm. for really people cool. to want to go play against. Jim Harbaugh, yeah. legendary. That AFC West is absurd. What is some news that's kind of cooking here as we swing into Super Bowl week? Because it feels like we almost have yeah. everything all at this yeah. point. There really isn't anything. Yeah, I mean, the a couple of the key hires, right? So you got who's going to be the offensive coordinator – for the Seahawks, 
you know, who's going to be the offensive coordinator for the commanders. And the fact that the Chip Kelly thing Mm -hmm. is very interesting to me, right? Like he interviewed twice kind of like secretly for the Raiders. They chose Cliff Kingsbury over him, which I thought was Hmm. interesting. And again, I like the hire, so that makes sense. But Dan Quinn has talked about him potentially joining his staff. Um, That'll be interesting to see if, if that happens. And then, you know, Washington, I know, has some interest in Jeff Grubb, who's the Alabama offensive coordinator there. We'll see if that ends up happening. Seattle but I think or Washington? Seattle, you know, right? Seattle, yeah. state of Washington. Yeah, oh, what I say? You said Washington. Well, well it is in, yeah, it's confusing. It's in Washington, but Seattle is who I think. Yeah, we all know that. Yeah. Appreciate it. So, but otherwise, like, no you got through the coaching stuff, and it's kind of like we'll get to Vegas for Super Bowl, and it's like we'll turn our attention to the players again, and there's so many. There's so much quarterback like instability. Um, is there a d- draft trade? Does someone trade up? Like, there's a lot of really fun stuff that's coming now that we've kind of about to turn the page on the coaching stuff. Rap, you're the greatest, dude. You know that? We did miss you this year. Mm-hmm. As you're, being, I missed you guys. As you're being daytime host. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As you're being daytime host. Way to go. Hey. No, I missed you guys. It was tough. I'd see, I'd see the show sometimes in my own house. Oh, they no. would be watching it without me, which is offensive but i get it I guess. yeah because your show's on at the same time yeah. i can mm-hmm. certainly see how that could be how about this offensive so so jude so both of my boys uh have apple watches now right so we can keep track of them so they don't run away mm-hmm. smart and jude gets that. alerts on his apple watch and he goes i get so many notifications i'm like from what he goes well i subscribe to the pat mcafee show on youtube and so i get a lot of not- i'm like did you actually that a baby said, jude, yeah. baby jude. jude. Without my guidance, this is what happened. Well, I'm hey, the guidance is good, you know, because tell Jude and Max that the person that's getting the notifications from, uh, we stood on a table for their dad, mm-hmm. you know, that's to right. be able to join another network. And then their dad just immediately said, ah, that's funny. <laughs> Turn around. Let me stab Fuck you. you. Yeah, don't yeah. care. Yeah, that's what happened. Wait, I thought. Yeah. That's I thought we're not. Hmm. But I thought we're not allowed. We can say that here. Third Who's we? Yeah, son yeah, of it's a not bitch. Out, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, you just watch oh, your mouth. Yeah. You watch like, whoa, the camera. Whoa. There. Now, third hour, YouTube, ESPN Plus. First two hours, Ron, ESPN. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. We, so we can say whatever we want. I'm still not going to get there, but yeah. One day. Oh, maybe, though. Going into Super Bowl mm-hmm. next week, huh? You got whoa. your hair cut? Let loose a little bit? Have a couple cocktails? I mean, it, it is a very solid party situation we got going on in Vegas. I'm excited. I'm sure I'll see you out on You're the circuit, right? To. So what do you do? You so Super Bowl is like, I mean obviously it's a Super Bowl, but for you the way the Super Bowl is, events, boozing, handshaking, everybody's there. Like this is Vegas, the Rap Bowl. This is the Rap Bowl. Yeah, this is Rap Sheets time. Yeah, tomorrow. I mean, now there's a couple of them, right? We got Combine coming up. Oh. That's really the time. So you get a little like like I was in Mobile the last couple of days. There was a little bit of that there, a little handshake, a little like, can I get you something? You know. Um, What's your drink like of choice this year? Because last year was just anything, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the year before was Jaeger. Yeah. Because you yeah. finished a couple bottles of Jaeger. Yeah, because you, you were kind of... Yeah. Okay. And then I think Fireball. Oh, Goldschlager. I used to love Goldschlager when I was 21. When I was 21, that's when oh, I used to drink it. Yeah. yeah, good call there. Remember back yep, whenever when you were on the crew oh. team there, all roided out of your mm-hmm. mind. Yep. Yep. Big bad When I was 21. Rap. Yeah, big um, bad I was, I was, Get the Goldschlager. I need you know, Gold Talker if you want me to crew today. <laughs> Come on, freshman. <laughs> what did I tell you? Paul. Paul. Slog. <laughs> we know no, it's, got were... of, it's got flakes of gold in it. Yeah, that's what they say. Mm-hmm. That's what they say. Pretty expensive drink. I've never actually tested it. Um, I would say just beer, casual beer. Uh, how this? You know casual. what I was thinking about? There, he is. there we go. Oh. Whoa. That is Whoa. the man we're talking to right now in the hat. Yep. Backwards Wait, hat. Who is that? Not Giamatti. That is the man we were talking That is Ian Rappaport right there. <laughs> Yes, yes. You're thinking to yourself, no way, no way. Yes, mm-hmm. that's that is it. him. That's and it. that's Goldschlager slamming. Yeah, Ian Rappaport right there. We didn't even. As soon as this photo was done, he actually yelled at the team. The faster we go, the faster we get some Goldschlager. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what was happening there. Good well, for you, Rap. it was a lightweight sport, and so you know you had weigh-ins, so you didn't want to drink a lot of beer because that would really weigh you so, down. So really, the hard stuff would. Did you have be to stay under efficient. a certain weight? Did each guy have a weight you had to stay under? So the boat had to average a certain weight, and if you were, like, better, stronger, basically, you could be a little heavier. And if you were not as good, me, you would have to be a little light. Also, I'm not very tall, so you'd have to be a little lighter. So everyone sort of had to be at their weight. So why were you... 
team captain. Why were you roided out of your mind? Yeah. You looked like you yeah. weighed 240 there. The back of the muscle. boat. No, I was like 155. 150, something like that. That guy day. behind you weigh 95? Yeah, that's 150 pounds. <laughs> Your head you. weighs 80 pounds <laughs> there, Basically, Rab. Yeah, I mean, that, they, you know, the camera does some tricks, which I support. Well, also, this is when he started beefing up because he started smoking meat this year in Colombia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. He, he became one of the most of, efficient meat smokers in yeah. town. Mm-hmm. And I saw that. Um, a lot you know of what I was thinking of today? A lot of protein. A lot of protein. You know what I was thinking of today? Well, yeah. So, Ted, you guys saw Bruce the story Springsteen? about Teddy Bridgewater, right? Which one? The Teddy Bridgewater is going to be high school uh, coach of his alma mater. Mm-hmm. That's sweet. You see this? No, I it's, didn't see I mean, nice. it's the gig that he was, like, born to have. I mean, it's, he actually was secretly coaching high school while he was with the Dolphins because he just – he was, like, a volunteer. Teddy Bridgewater is the best. Anyway, um, you were talking about, you know, you go to the Super Bowl, you see people like, hey, can I get you a drink? So I was at a steakhouse in Miami when the Super Bowl was there a couple of years ago. I run into Bridgewater. Comes over, says hello, kind of daps it up because we're, you know, obviously great friends. And up, step it up. So I'm like, um, I'm like, hey, can I, can I get you a drink, whatever? And, and he's like, well, you know, we'll, we'll see. And he kind of goes to his table. So I send a text to someone who knows him well. And I'm like, does Teddy drink? He's like, actually, no. So I couldn't buy him a drink. So instead, I sent shrimp cocktail to his table. Oh, nice. You always work an angle. Yeah, yeah, you know, because Teddy walks over, he goes, what's <laughs> up, rap? You know, yep. yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm not, <laughs> oh, no. not like on the ground. Well, well you're uh, sitting down. You're sitting down. <laughs> yeah, I'm like one of those chairs. I would not expect like that. Sushi place. Where's like the, you know when you're like the under the table. That's not me. <laughs> Brad, we, grill. We can't wait to see you next mm-hmm. week, bub. We cannot wait to see Be you fun. next week. We're excited for this run you're about to go on and uh, have a phenomenal weekend. What do you got cooking? When are you going to Vegas? AJ said today, tomorrow. When are you trying to get out? Um, going Sunday morning. So be there. Got some good restaurants cooking. Let's be some. I won't be doing anything myself, but really good people will be cooking for me, and I'm going to eat so much. It's going to be great. Are you going to head to all those events, huh? You're heading to all those parties. You're heading to all of them. Um, I'll I'll go to some of the parties. You love Probably. those. You, you're the one that no. we talk about no. whenever we walk in and yeah. Hey, yeah. how are you? No, What's no, my, one, my biggest. No, my big issue is that Saturday night we have to get up at like three in the morning because we have a nine hour pregame show. So I'm always out on Saturday night parties. Stay up all night. Oh. Yeah, why don't, don't you be an be idiot. Old school yeah. rap, Columbia yeah. rap. Once a year. Could actually. Then my eyes would look bad now. Good, good night's sleep, game day. You're yeah. right. We appreciate the hell out of you, ladies and gentlemen. Ian Rap. Yeah, rap. Just the same old raps. Yep. yep. Hasn't changed out. a bit. You what? caught me by surprise with the zoom out. For I didn't know why they were zoomed out and they're showing full body, and then you went down for the dab. It got me. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Remember when we saw Rap for the first time? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. We had built up a pretty good relationship with Rappaport mm-hmm. over the years. Yeah. Love Rappaport. Mm-hmm. For the same reason you all probably have fallen in love with him over the last few weeks. <laughs> if you did not know him before, he started popping in here the last few weeks. He is just the best. Mm-hmm. Just unflappable confidence. Mm-hmm. Always rap. Just whatever. Of course, yeah. Uh, bing, boom, boom. I know this person. Bang, pow. No, you don't. Boom. Okay, who cares? Keep it moving. Like, he's just... He is an awesome individual. And the first time he came to our office at a combine, I remember us all going, whoa. No way. Are you serious? Where's the rest of you? The aging. <laughs> it was unbelievable. What? How, what, no, he's not. Like, what, how tall is he? 5'4". No. Most. No, he's Come seven. on now. Seven. Mm. You're right, though. Guys, I thought we were doing confidence. karma. I thought we were doing good karma. <laughs> you're right. Let's get it out of us. Yeah, That's what exactly. I'm saying. He was much taller. He was actually taller than I expected. When yeah, I you're him. right. When I saw him, I was like, damn. Especially to our friend. <laughs> you know? Damn, you're huge. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow, I didn't expect you to be this big. He yeah, is, exactly. He's absolutely jocked. <laughs> yeah, jocked. Jock. He's absolutely jocked, and he's always on. <laughs> I mean, like 24-7, always on. Yep. Has to be on his phone, obviously. Wife, fantastic. Max and Jude, shout out. Shout, shout out. Jude. Shout out to Max and Jude. He doesn't swear on the show, though, which pissing me off because he's got the mouth of a sailor. He when, he, when he first came into the office that time, he dropped eight F-bombs in the first two minutes. See, I, I didn't even pick that one up. You did, though. Oh, yeah. You it, said, well, you're filtering all of a sudden. Yeah, I was like, are you swearing because oh. you think that we just come in here and swear like a bunch of assholes, or are you swearing because this is how you talk? Yeah, and you always got to get a good read on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Raps the man.
I can't wait to see him next week. I cannot wait to hear what news is breaking this weekend. He'll be in the middle of boozing pretty hard, trying to oh, wheel God. and deal and get a new connector, a new source, and all of a sudden something will break and he'll have to, whoa, yep. immediately, anytime it is. 2 a.m., you get a text, you don't break it while you're going to someone else next time. He's been living that life for 20 years. Schefter's been doing it for like 35. Oh, man. It's crazy. That, that sources game, insider game. One, Did Jay Glazer start it? I yeah. think so. Mm -hmm. I think he potentially did. And then he said he retired from the day-to-day, -day, right? I, I think that was kind of when he stepped away from it. Yeah, I mean, when you're the king, you know, uh, you have to find a successor. So, you know, these guys can play games, but they know anytime I come back, I am the fucking king. And I'll behead someone at the drop of a needle if I have to. <laughs> also, <laughs> Vegas is my fucking city. <laughs> Let's just say Glaze is going to put on a show on the strip. I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait to see what Glaze does next <laughs> week. Uh, going into the weekend, we are incredibly proud and pumped for the fact that one of the friends of and family of the program is launching his first single with the Universal Music label. Hey, oh, yeah. guy got signed. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Guy got signed. That's a huge oh. ordeal. Obviously, he was a stud football player. We've known for a long time. Off seasons, he is fantastic with us. The best. Ladies and gentlemen, Ferrari Kit debuted today. A rap song produced by this man, Adam Pac Man Jones. Yeah, Pac Man. How are you, man? Where are you? You're down in Atlanta getting ready for the big release party tonight? Oh, yeah, I'm down here. Actually, we just got through racing cars right here at the Porsche. I don't know if you can see that. A um, couple 911s. We got to take out and tap the track. Um, ready for the night, though, baby Ferrari kick. I'm excited. Hey, we're very pumped for you. Congratulations. A lot of hard work. Let's go, yeah. Pat. A lot of hard right, work Pat. has gotten to this point tonight. So tonight you have a release party at Magic City. Shout out to you. Obviously, the wings are going to be fantastic. This song is going to be loved. Uh, what's next? What do we got? What do we got the next few weeks back? Um, we moving. We got Grammys next. Moving. And uh, the next single is Standing on Business, SOB. What I stole a couple lines from you from, but um, yeah, man, excited, <laughs> really excited. We got a show tonight. We got another show next week um, in Tampa. Um, it's been pretty good. We're all incredibly proud of you. Go ahead, AJ. Pack, are you? Uh, do you get more done in 24 hours every <laughs> like than anybody else on the planet? When I follow you, like watching the amount of things that you do and the amount of work that you do, and then you're coaching 400 different practices, and then you're on a four-wheeler running with your kids on the street, and then you, you release a new single. Like, you get so much done. Do you ever get tired? Do you ever sleep? Um, I do get a little bit of sleep. I don't get tired. Um, I enjoy doing the things that I love doing. I love talking shit, which I'm pretty good at. I love being on the show. I love having um, all of the kids function, trying to stay young with them. It's never a dull moment with me with, a, with, with all these kids. Uh, but I love it, AJ. You got a whole bunch of them, too, now. You got to stay young with these kids. Yeah, well, I, I mean... I don't do as much as you. I wish I, I wish I had your energy. Yeah, because you're, you're not only... You got, like, what, seven D1 athletes in your house <laughs> yeah, right now. Seven, <laughs> I think six or seven D1 athletes that are all teenagers or younger. So having to mentor and grow and do that. But then also... Trying to hustle this rap career going. You're in L.A., you're in Atlanta, you're in Miami. Then you're back in Ohio walking those two dogs. Big dogs. That are yeah. fucking Grandma's wolves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. fucking wolves. They're yeah. not dogs. And then you're working out. You're right. Hey, you're crushing it back. Like, legitimately watching it. you. Like, so much shit happening all at the same time. I assume tonight the vibes are going to be very high. How do you feel going in? I feel good. The vibes are going to be all positive vibes, man. Nice little, nice little night. I think it's going to go crazy. I'm going to do four songs, so I performed pretty good. I already did the walkthrough um, earlier, so I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, you've never been in Magic City before, right? Never in your life? Uh, well, never really performing, Pat. Like, sound check and all of this. This is kind of new from us doing, like, the pod and us doing the show. Um, it's, a, it's a little different when you're up there. Uh, it's almost like the stand-up comedian, I would say, like what you did. Oh, yeah. Well, I can't do that well. Up Magic there by yourself. Hey. You get a little, little, little lonely up there if you don't know what you're doing. Hey, Magic City, though, you're going to be all by yourself on the stage? I didn't know that was the case. Well, probably when I perform, I'll be by myself. Um, 
couple of adult ballerinas. Well, I will not be by myself. I just thought about that. Yeah, there's going to no, be... We'll have a couple adult dancers around me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Definitely would not be by myself. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I think you're going to have yeah. some... I think you're... Yeah, I think you're going to be sharing the stage a little yeah. bit. But that is the yeah, purpose. Yeah, i sharing it. Yeah, Con Man has a question for you, Pac. <laughs> yeah, Pac Man, Ferrari kit itself has a song. Where did it come from here? Do you have like 15 Ferraris that we don't know about? Or what was the inspiration for the first single? Well, Ferrari is probably one of my favorite cars, first of all. And when I'm rapping in this song, I'm really talking about my lifestyle. Like, my lifestyle is a Ferrari kit. Everything I do is pium, 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 pium. The way I work out is pium. high standard. So when I was coming up with this song, I was more thinking about myself. Like, damn, this is a Ferrari kit. Like, I'm a Ferrari. And so that's how I came up with that. And I'm more, more talking about my lifestyle, the family, myself, as in, like, what we built on. And, like, if I could... Put it into a car, I would say Ferrari kit. So I, that's how I came up with that Ferrari. I don't think a lot of people know this. You have a studio in your house. Like, you've been rapping a long time. Why now for, I mean, I guess Universal signing you is a massive ordeal. But why do you yeah. think now is the time that it's all kind of coming together for you? Um, I think because I can, I, can, I can let loose now. Like, at first I couldn't let loose because of the shield I was up under. Um, with the media being... What it is now, I think everybody have a platform of freedom of speech or whatever they want to deliver. It's all about how you deliver it. So I, that's the reason why I think it's working now, because I could really just go and talk about my whole past. Um, I could talk about good things, bad things. And um, that's what media is today. Um, so I think that's why more now than back then. As somebody that has known you for a long time, I think it's very apparent if you ever meet Pac-Man, that you enjoy being around Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. You put yourself in some situations, I think we all have, <laughs> that have certainly not been great, but every yeah. single time, I feel like you make a massive effort on bettering yourself and the people around you. We hope Ferrari Kid is a smashing success, and we hope tonight's a blast, brother. Smell me! <laughs> all right, we'll see you soon back in here. On the back, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Ladies, yeah. and, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Adam Pac-Man Jones. We're proud of you, buddy. Yeah, Pac. Love you, Pac. All right. Awesome. He's awesome. Let's go. go. Magic Pac. City tonight. Oh. It's going to be great. How's that do people perform there a lot? People do, yeah. Every yeah. night? Every night. Yeah, a lot of I people, mean, dude, like, on, do people hold a microphone and perform there every night? I think there has been a few in the past, if I do recall, some music videos and such. That's uh, a big deal. It's a big deal. It's Friday night, too. Like, yeah, he's, he's performing there. As a 17-year-old... Uh, well, I guess 18, because I was a freshman at West Virginia. We played in the Sugar Bowl in Atlanta, and Pac-Man from Atlanta, mm -hmm. which is where Magic City is. And I had known him through the year because he was working out with us in the summer, even though he was in the NFL at the time. So he had a lot of money, a lot of connections. So that Sugar Bowl week, I potentially had been in that place with Pac-Man <laughs> Jones. That was fun. What a wild scene. Yeah. Just me, think of me as an 18-year-old. In Magic City with Pac-Man and Cheetah. And this is the week of Sugar Bowl. It's like, yeah, this is this is fucking hilarious. Good time. Just having the time of my life. And it's been like, you know, a long time with me and Pac-Man knowing each other. And he's certainly been through some shit. I've certainly been through some shit. And uh, I think if you meet him, like you have AJ and the boys have, like inside, he means well. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. Great. He means well. Yeah, I think everybody that's ever been a teammate of his is like thankful they're teammates of his. Friends, the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just like, we got to eliminate the bad situations. And I think he's continuing to do that going forward, let alone what he's doing, you know, for Slim's kid, Chris mm -hmm. Henry, who passed away, and his family. It's like, the guy means well. He has an exorbitant amount of talent yeah. mm -hmm. and energy. And it's like, here we go. Now the music industry has signed him, and I can't wait to see what the next couple months, years are for him in there, in that world, AJ. Man, he, I mean, Pac works his balls off. I was, I was yes. his teammate one year in Cincinnati, and, like, he made the whole team better. He honestly did. How he practiced, he, I mean, if he wanted to lock people up, he would just lock them up all day long and practice, and then guys get mad, and then everyone has to elevate their level. And he, yeah, I was so impressed, and I, I was – it was so much fun to be Pac's teammate, honestly. It really was. So, obviously, he did Undercover Dogs for us uh, for the last half of the year. Yep. He had two podcasts, was building a rap career. Mm -hmm. Like, this football season, a lot going on. Very busy. He'll be back with us in the offseason right here. I cannot wait for that. To be honest. I cannot wait for that. And uh, I wish him nothing but the best tonight. Hell, you know? yeah. Should be a great one. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a great time. The videos coming out of that are going to be so absurd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I need a live yeah. stream. It'll be so absurd. That'd be sweet. Oh, yeah. I just want to watch. he is... 
He's doing four songs too. He said. Yeah, and he is right now. Oh yeah, he's jacked. He maybe, jacked. maybe more oh, jacked than ever. He's real excited for this because, like, getting signed by Universal, big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this has been a goal of his, I think, probably since oh, yeah. forever. He's like a a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would assume. So he's trying to hit it and get it as hard and as good as possible. You know, like trying to go all in in this. It's like. Go get it. Build a studio in the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a worker. I'll get like a picture, like 1.32 a.m. with like a little voice memo. Like, there's some new shit I'm working on right now. And I'll wake up like 6 a.m. I'm like, this motherfucker sent this three hours ago? Mm -hmm. And then I'll get a text from him like an hour later. I'm like, bro, when do you? Like people say, I, I don't sleep. When do you actually? He fucking does it. I don't think he does. Mm -hmm. I think he just goes forever. I, I think that's the Pac-Man energy. Does things he wants to do. It's pretty cool to see. Like he's, yeah. Do what I want to do. I'm like, oh, it looks like a lot of fun, actually. In, in the story of what he's doing with all the... There's literally seven D1 athletes in his house right mm -hmm. now. So cool. Shout out to Tish. Yeah. Shout out also. Yeah. Shout out to Tish. Weapon. All right. She's awesome. How many people? 20. 20, yeah. It's Friday. I haven't shot this in a while. No? Yeah. I have not shot this in a while. I also haven't lifted all week. Get yeah, 20. 20. pretty lazy. You're pretty lazy. Well, end of the season. Tip was messing up your shot a little bit, so you just got to adjust your the this, weight you how, how much you lift, right? So we think twenty people, five hundred dollars yeah. on this feel good Friday. Hell yeah! Mm. On this NFL quarterback Mount Rushmore week. What? On this Ferrari kit Friday. What? Ooh, we think twenty that. people, five hundred dollars. Yep. Yeah. Bucket. Oh baby! Come, so. come on! Come on! I think so. <laughs> Have a phenomenal weekend. NHL All-Star Game is tomorrow. It'll be electrifying. The Pro Bowl on Sunday, it'll be fantastic. And then we'll be back on Monday, kicking off Super Bowl week. Woo! And then we'll be at Radio Row in Las Vegas on yeah. Wednesday. We are so incredibly lucky. Boys, you crushed it this week. Way to go. Thank you back. Good week. AJ, great work this week, pal. Yep. Great work, guys. To all of our guests, thank you for the time. To all the people that watch, you're the greatest people on earth. We can't thank you enough. You should be one of the 20 people that wins $500. All you got to do is repost this post, say something nice to somebody, and also put the easiest way to pay you. We will pick the winners on Wednesday. Unless we make a graphic that isn't right, then we will pick the winners <laughs> on Thursday, nice. and you will get your money as efficiently and quickly as the platforms will allow us. On the way out of here, let's remember that you can be a friend and tell a friend something nice. Mm -hmm. It might change their life. That's a real statement. Even the people that appear to potentially be happy, why not send them a compliment just to reassure the fact that they're good people? We're all in this thing together. Team on me, team on three. One, two, three, team. team. Have a great weekend. Goodbye.